Good morning. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. I'm the chair of the Criminal Justice T Committee, Keith Powers. If you're here for specialized high schools, you should be next door, as, as the big hearing also happened next door. Uh, but thank you for being here. We're conducting a hearing today on the experience of transgender and gender nonconforming people in New York City jails. Um, and I want to thank the Department of Corrections and Correctional Health Services and many others for being here. Um, we want to start by saying that the department has made a number of strides in this area and has proven itself to be a leader in the nation in developing policy to house incarcerated individuals in accordance with their gender identity and in operating a transgen transgender housing unit commonly called THU for its transgender women. It, and it recently moved that THU to the Rose M. Singer uh, building facility where transgender women now have greater access to more gender responsive services and I want to thank them for doing that. Uh, but we, of course, always believe there's still work, more work to be done. We've spoken with a number of the advocates in the room today who have told the stories of transgender clients being rejected from the THU for unclear reasons. At the same time, we've also seen written statements from transgender incarcerated individuals raising questions about compliance with federal requirements regarding proper path risks. Considering that transgender individuals face higher rates of sexual victimization than cisgender individuals, it is important that the department is taking every possible measure to ensure the safety of transgender individuals in its custody. Today, we will all be hearing five bills aimed at improving the lives of transgender, transgender, gender nonconforming, gender non-binary, and intersex people in custody. The first two bills, introduction, introductions numbers 1513 and 1514 by Councilmember Ayala, aim to ensure that housing units uh, where T TGNC and BI populations are housed have the same access to mental health and substance use treatments as do units that house cisgender populations. The third bill is my bill, Introduction 1532, which will require the department to create an independent appeals process for the denial of housing requests. And Councilmember Moya's bill, which accompanies it, Introduction Number 1530, will require the department to issue comprehensive reporting on such bills. Finally, we're going to hear a bill on this topic from Councilman Rosenthal, 1535, which will require the Board of Correction to convene a task force to address policies related to the treatment of transge transgender, gender nonconforming, and non-binary individuals to the department, in the Department of Correction. In addition to those bills, we're hearing two important resolutions that aim to move pending legislation at the State of New York. We are thankful for the state legislature and the governor for their efforts earlier this year to uh, reform uh, the criminal justice system about speedy trials, discovery, and bail reform. Um, but we know that there are still issues pending out there in the state that the city council and others uh, in this room today care much about. Uh, the first resolution, 829, which is I'm sponsoring, will call the state to pass uh, Senate Bill 1343 and Assembly Bill 5493 to reform parole, conditional release, revocation, presumptive release, and post-release supervision, supervision to reduce the number of people held in jails and prisons in New York State. Uh, the second resolution, 143A, introduced by my colleague, Councilmember Drom, is in support of the Humane Alternatives to Long-Term Solitary Confinement Act, and commonly known as the HALT Act. That is an important piece of legislation that would amend New York State correction law by limiting the time an incarcerated individual spends time in segregated confinement. It would also be remiss of me to mention that this New York City has also been a leader in that area, and I want to thank both the Department and the Board of Corrections for their work around solitary confinement. Um, and with that said, I also want to thank my staff who has helped put this hearing together. Uh, we had also, I should mention, just uh, we've met with a number of groups who are doing works in, the, the, in this, these areas. I want to thank them for their input a, as well. Um, and I also want to recognize we have a number of colleagues here today who are joining us from our committee, Councilmember Bob Holden, Councilmember Carlina Rivera, Councilmember Lika Amprey Samuel, and Councilmember Danny Drom. I'm going to, before we uh, move on, I'm going to ask uh, Councilmember Drom to say a few words about his resolution today. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Long-term solitary confinement is torture, plain and simple. As responsible policymakers, we must act to dismantle this especially gruesome practice of the new Jim Crow, whether in city jails or state prisons. For years, I've been helping to amplify the voices of the advocates, including survivors. Many of them are here today, and I want them to know their cries for justice were not solitary and definitely not in vain, as the political momentum has now pushed the issue to the fore. I also want to pause and take a moment to recognize someone who ultimately did not make it, although his life was not in vain, as it has spurred us to act. 
Khalif Browder. Victims are often individuals struggling with serious mental health issues. This punishment does not lead to any changed behavior, but rather an exacerbation of their agony and an increase in future violence. Even those who go in with adequate mental health leave the Bing with scars that last a lifetime. Resolution 143 supports the HALT Solitary Confinement Act, which is state legislation aimed at curbing the government's complicity in this form of torture. New York City is not where it ultimately needs to be on this issue, but it has made significant strides. However, we must always be vigilant as the Department of Correction has chipped away at efforts and by the City Council and the Board of Correction to lead reforms. Strictly limiting the use of solitary confinement has benefits far beyond protecting individual human rights. Facility security and public safety will improve. For how does unimaginably brutalizing incarcerated individuals and then releasing them to the general population or the general public promote security and safety? It is time for the state to act to end this practice, and I hope that this hearing and the eventual passage of Resolution 143 will encourage Albany to include the Halt Solitary Confinement Act in its efforts to reform the criminal justice system. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we will now hear testimony from uh, the Department of Corrections and I believe uh, uh, Health Services as well, Correctional Health Services as well. Before <coughs> we do that, we're just gonna take the opportunity to swear you in. If every person could raise your right hand, um, state your name starting from the left to the right. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You can begin your testimony when you're ready. Good morning, Chair Powers and members of the Committee on Crim Criminal Justice. I am Faye Yalardi, the Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Sexual Abuse and Sexual Harassment Prevention for the New York City Department of Correction. Joining me at the table this morning are my colleagues who will assist me with answering questions today. I have to my right, Acting Warden Bibi Suarez, thank you, of Rose M. Singer Center. To my left, I have Prashel Shannon, Senior Institution Administrator who previously served as a DOJ Certified Prison Rape Elimination Act, better known as PREA, auditor for four years. And I have Heidi Grossman, our Deputy General Counsel, and I'm happy to join at the table our partners from Correctional Health Services. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss the department's work and our efforts to provide safe housing and services to transgender, gender non-conforming, and intersex individuals within our custody. Today, I am pleased to provide opening remarks about the grand, I'm sorry, about the groundbreaking work we have undertaken to afford individuals in our custody housing by gender identity, as well as our ongoing efforts to institutionalize policies, practices that support and sustain sexual safety. I will also comment on intro 1513, intro 1514, intro 1530, intro 1532, and intro 1535, the five bills being considered today. This, to, this department is committed to ensuring the safety and security of everyone in our custody. The population within DOC's facilities is as diverse as the population of New York City and the department recognized its responsibility to provide safe housing, responsive health care, and engaging in programs to everyone who enters the facility. In accordance with Executive Order 16, the department now houses individuals in our custody by gender identity. And we have become a national leader in this practice, 
and are proud that jurisdictions across the country now look to New York City as a model for the placement and housing of transgender, gender non-conforming, and intersex individuals. Our practices have been developed to close, in close consultation with leaders in the LGBTQI policy and advocacy communities, as well as through conversations with cities, Commission on, on Human Rights. We have also worked to provide our uniformed officers with sensitive and accurate training on the needs and rights of Can you just close the door? Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you're all done. Um, so we have also worked to provide our uniform officers and with sensitivity and accurate training on the needs and rights of transgender, gender non-conforming, and intersex individuals in the department's custody in order to ensure these individuals are treated with understanding and respect. The department is committed to safe housing and during intake, officers complete a security screening tool to assess an individual's risk of victimization. Categories that are assessed by an intake officer include, but are not limited to, whether an individual is small in stature, the nature of the crime an individual is accused of, whether or not an individual has a history of violent crime or committing sexual abuse, whether or not an individual has been a victim of sexual abuse, and whether an individual, ident whether an individual identifies or presents as gender nonconforming, and whether the individual is LGBTQI. The affirmative items checked on the screening tool are scored, and in consideration of additional security information, a housing placement is reached. The department takes special care to separate those who may be at risk of abuse, potentially including those who are gender nonconforming from those known to the department to be abusers. In some cases, depending on their score on the risk assessment, it may make sense to house some gender nonconforming in protective custody. In other cases, that may not be warranted. In addition, everyone who is newly admitted into custody and identifies as transgender and or intersex is offered the transgender intersex housing form, which we also call the TIH form. The TIH form, which specifically asks if the individual identifies as transgender and or intersex, is a critical piece of the department's process of identifying individuals eligible for the transgender housing unit known as THU. The TIH form also affords transgender and or intersex individuals an opportunity to indicate if they would prefer to be housed within a male facility, a female facility, or the THU. The THU was created in 2015 and was initially housed in male facilities before moving to Rosie's in July of 2018. Our THU model has set the national standard for transgender and intersex housing in jail facilities. The co-location of the THU with Rosie's has allowed transgender and intersex individuals who choose to reside in a female facility with the opportunity to access the same programs, same services, and health care as every other woman within the department's custody. The move also provided an opportunity for certain transgender and intersex individuals to be housed within GP housing units at Rosie's, if so choose. In addition to the THU unit itself, Rosie's is also home to a dedicated transgender new admission housing unit. If an individual going through intake at a male facility self-identifies as transgender or intersex, that individual will be transferred to Rosie's to complete the intake process. That is to say, the department does not wait to assess an individual before transferring them to Rosie's to complete their intake process. Safe housing take priority over paperwork. Per PREA regulations and the Board of Corrections minimum standards, all THU admission decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis. In every consideration, the department considers both the health and safety of the individual applying to the THU unit. 
the safety and well-being of the individuals already in the THU unit, and overall management and security operations, the transgender or intersex individual's view on placement with respect to his or her own safety is given serious consideration in this process. From October 2018 to March 2019, the department received 115 applications for the THU. The breakdown of those applications is as follows. Of the 115 forms received, 29 individuals preferred to be housed in the male facility. Of the remaining 86 individuals seeking admission to THU, 12 individuals were discharged before an assessment could be completed. On the remaining 74 individuals, 62 were placed in THU and 12 were denied for safety and security reasons. In the same six month period, three transgender men were held in DOC's custody per their request, all three individuals were housed at Rosie's. Just as any individual in DOC's custody can apply for placement in the THU, any individual can request to leave. If an individual no longer wishes to be housed in the THU, or if a transgender or intersex individual no longer wishes to be housed in our general population unit within Rosie's, they are able to complete a voluntary discharge form. <clears throat> All THU requests are closely and thoroughly reviewed by the PREA unit, which is comprised of a PREA supervisor, a representative from CHS, and the warden of a designated facility. The review considers the individual's views with respect to his or her own view, as well as information from the risk assessment tool. The department then makes a case-by-case -case determination about how to ensure safety for it, each transgender or intersex individual in our custody. As, requ as required by the federal standard and also the Board of Correction minimum standards. An individual will either be approved or denied housing within the female facility if the individual imposes a safety and or security concern. Any individual denied placement into the THU is informed of the reasons for the denial and has the opportunity to have their request reconsidered with the understanding that a secondary review will be held if the individual has new information to present. At present, the PREA unit handles these appeals. We are in the process of developing a more robust review process. However, in the details of this plan, I'm sorry, however, the details of this plan are still in development. We look forward to updating the council on our appeal process as it comes to fruition. It would be impossible for me to speak about the progress the department has made in its efforts to safely house transgender and gender nonconforming and intersex individuals without discussing the great work we have done to adhere to increase our PREA compliance. Since 2015, when the department announced it would be voluntarily implementing PREA standards, we have worked tirelessly to implement staff-wide PREA training and refresher courses and draft policies and operational practices in line with PREA guidelines. As part of the federal grant that assists correctional facilities in becoming PREA certified, the department has enlisted the assistance of the Marsh Group, a nationally recognized expert in PREA and LGBTQI issues to outline a multi-year plan that will bring the department into full compliance. The department has also successfully trained over 10,000 DOC employees on PREA with training provided to all incoming recruits and there are monthly scheduled trainings for all DOC non-uniform staff, contractors, and volunteers. Training is vital to remind staff of the importance of professional and respectful terminology and of their responsibility to protect vulnerable populations whenever they, are be, whenever they, are, they may be housed or wherever they may be housed. <clears throat> Finally, I will now com comment on intro 1513, intro 1514, intro 1530, intro 1532, and intro 1535. 
Every individual in DOC's custody has equal access to health care and mental health care. The department supports the spirit of intro 1513 and 15 and 1514. In fact, the department is home to the oldest methadone clinic in the country and wants to impress upon the council that providing these services to everyone is a responsibility the department takes seriously. Whether legislated to or not, DOC will continue to ensure healthcare access is afforded to all individuals in our custody. Regarding intro 1530, which we understand to be a companion bill to 1532, the department supports the general premise of the bill, but would like to work with the council on the matrix and wording so as not to produce duplicative information as what is already reported to the Board of Correction. As a national correctional leader in housing by gender identity, the department shares the council's interest in having a tool to assess an individual's risk of victimization, a fair and thoughtful process to make certain housing assignments on a case-by-case -case basis and a process for an appeal of that assignment. The department is in the process of designing a robust secondary review process that allows for review by parties not involved in the original decision process. As bill negotiations continue, we'd appreciate the opportunity to talk through our existing process with council more fully and work together to devise legislation that supports fairness and safe housing for all. Intro 35 requires the creation of a task force, which mainly which mainly with mainly internal parties to advise on DOC policies and security protocols. While we appreciate the spirit of cap collaboration of this bill, the department cannot support this legislation. The department has worked closely with advocates and LGBTQI policy experts to advise our existing policies and programs. In fact, we already meet with advocates on a quarterly basis and sometimes more frequently to address ongoing issues. However, there is a difference between, a difference from bringing in issue areas experts to advise on policy creation and having issue area experts who are not experts in corrections and security make recommendations on security policy. The department opposes individuals without a correctional service background advising on security and housing policies and transmissions to the mayor and the council. In addition, we have serious concerns about potentially sharing sensitive and confidential information with individuals who lack authority to possess access to this information. However, we remain open to additional conversations about avenues to integrate LGBTQI advocates into operational decisions as we have with advocates concerned with visiting practices, program offering, offerings, and bail procedures. As you can see, the department has worked hard to improve the safety and experience of transgen transgender, gender nonconforming, and intersex individuals in our custody. The department appreciates council's interest and support in these matters, and we look forward to continuing to work with you, the board, advocates and stakeholders to build upon the work we have already done and remain a national model for the correctional institutions across the country for years to come. We would also extend an invitation to council to visit our THU so you can see the good work we are doing for yourselves. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that. <clears throat> um, I want to talk just on the legislative stuff first, then I'm going to go into um, some questions about intake and, and housing, and then I know we have a couple members who have questions here as well. But um, just on the legislative first, is, uh, does, the, does the administration support the two state bills that we're discussing today, the two resolutions? One is about the HALT Act, and the second is about uh, uh, reforming state parole. And I know I know you mentioned that because there was no mention of them in the right, in right. the uh, testimony. Um, well, first of all, um, I just want to start by saying that the department um, has been a leader in punitive segregation reform, as has been acknowledged. Um, we have, from 2014, we had maybe 600 or so individuals in punitive segregation on any given day, 
today, 2019, that, that average might go from 100 to 120. We've really reduced our reliance on punitive segregation. Um, I would also say that the, depart the city, the department, um, eliminated punitive segregation for the 16 to 21 year olds. Um, the, and the department eliminated punitive segregation for the 18 to 21 year olds. It, it's the first in the country, as we understand it, that has um, eliminated punitive segregation. Um, the department also reduced um, the maximum um, punitive segregation time from 90 days to 30 days uh, um, with ex under, uh, except under exceptional circumstances. And we only allow people in, uh, to remain in punitive segregation for 60 days within a six month period. We also allow people seven days um, out of in between their 30 day sentences. Um, so, the, so we feel that we've made a great deal of progress and we're seeing great success and we have reduced our reliance on punitive segregation. However, and so we feel this current system is working. Um, but the bill that, um, the state bill presents serious operational concerns for the department. So we um, have disagreement over the process and i um, happy to discuss this at, um, at another time, but that, that is the position of the department. And, and on the state parole reform? Apologies. We are supportive of this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we support that it pre prevents anyone um, in, in having unnecessary involvement within the cr criminal justice system, so we do support that. Okay, thank you for that. And we'll look forward for your comments on that uh, on the other bill as well. Um, 1535, you had mentioned some concerns around, uh, it, the, that's uh, Council Brent Rosenthal's bill, which you know tries to in be more inclusive in terms of uh, input into the agency. You mentioned that you have a process today in a place where you meet with uh, at groups and providers. Um, is that is that informalized in any way, or can you share with us what, what, what is that was happening? I mean, if the, if the comment is that, you have some concerns around the operational impact of doing 1535, but there is a process that's in place. Can you share with us what that process might look like today? So currently, or currently and in the past, we have met with some of the advocates and also stakeholders um, in working group settings. They have been very instrumental in the opening and of the THU and um, supplying information that we wouldn't normally have to open the THU. After that, we have had constant co communication with them um, in regards to training. We had one of our advocates help develop one of the trainings that we currently use for the uh, transgender housing unit and also for staff at the female facility. And we currently, because, since we've been housing by gender identity, we have continued communications with them, um, including meetings that were, that were facilitated by uh, CCHR. Okay, so who, who participates in that? How often do you meet? How does, um, how does a group or an individual become aware of when there's an opportunity to come meet or uh, participate in that? Or how do you choose who participates in that? Um, we're lucky enough that the advocates don't have a problem with reaching out to us and requesting for a meeting, and we're open to meet with them. At I, I want to be more specific about um, 1535 is about setting up a, a more formal process. So it, it sounds, I think you said we, you have an explanation of a process that you believe is in place today that would help integrate um, uh, ideas into into the DOC um, specifically around LGBTQI is, uh, issues. Um, so, it, is that when's the last time it met? It's been, I believe, it was, I think maybe in November, December, that we met, and it was um, facilitated by CCHR in regards to housing by gender identity. We would like to have a more a more robust process uh, mirroring some of the working groups that we currently have um, around the bail reform and, and programming. And so we're also looking into doing that as well. Okay, and I, just, I, I, met, I failed to mention, we're also joined by our health chair and, and new committee member, uh, Councilmember Mark Levine as well. Um, I, I guess my point is it says it's made on a quarterly basis. It hasn't met since November. Um, and I think the, the, the council is seeking a more formal process than sort of 
uh, ad hoc process for getting groups together. And I think that the people that are doing work in this area, um, whether it's formalized in legislation, not formalized in legislation, whether it is in this manner and context or not, I think you know the idea being that, um, and particularly in an in, in area and a population that has a lot of sensitivity around it, I think a lot of misinformation, misunderstanding around it, that there are opportunities for them to be able to provide, those who are doing the work on the ground to be able to provide meaningful input. And if you, I'm, I'm sure that even spending a, a, an afternoon in, in any in any agency, by the way, um, but particularly one that has uh, such an, an important role here, that um, you would find, you know, particular issues, even in terms of how pronouns are used or how people are uh, are, are are treated relative to their peers. So um, I, I think that's what that's what's being sought here. And, um, and so I think that you know, our, our request here, through in, either through legislation or, or potentially beyond that, is to have a working process where those groups know, who, you know it's a formalized process and the agency is, is, is bringing groups in and, and individuals in to hear and talk about issues that are arising in it. And Council Powell, I, I would also like to add, in addition to that, we um, have ongoing conversations with the Moss Group, who are the sexual safety experts in the field. We're actually contracted with them. Um, they provide technical assistance and um, just information um, about our policies and the trends that are in the LGBTQI community. So they offer um, excellent service and assistance. So we're, we're constantly um, I, I understand supported. that, but they are your contracted agency to provide try and training. I'm talking about having groups that are doing work and working with the, the vulnerable population here to also be able to have places for employees. Well, to your point, um, and we are happy to talk about a, not, a less formal process, um, not necessarily associated with the legislation, but to talk about how do we um, bring people together and have more of a process in place so that we can engage with the community. So we are open to that discussion. Okay, I appreciate that. And, and am I right saying that you have a, and I, I'm gonna go into some other areas, but there's a, as part of your THU directive, you have a THU advisory committee, is that correct? And can you tell us who's on it, how often they've met, and how many of the committee members are appointed? You said the THU advisory committee? Because I understand it based on the, it, there's an advisor committee put together pursuant to the THU directive. The, the previous THU directive, are you talking about? I believe, uh, I think it's the one from 2014. Yes. Okay. Um, so we have not in practice utilized the uh, advisory uh, committee and we are now looking to uh, make more robust um, committee information or committee members to assist with um, processes as far as um, how individuals are in, entered into the, the THU. But what we've also been sharing that policy with um, uh, members from the Board of Corrections um, internally, um, again, getting feedback from industry effort, um, experts to help us develop out that directive. Okay, I mean, if, if there is a requirement here to have an advisory committee and you're not doing it, this goes back to 2014, I'll, I'll read it to you. If the inmates, uh, there, it talks about the inmate may submit an appeal in writing to the THU advisory committee, uh, uh, and then the commander of the facility can uh, scan this request. So you, there is no THU advisory committee, is that, is that correct? Right, no, there is, I think that when, um, back in 2014 when we, um, we established, um, we had an advisory committee and we met with um, some of the advocates and, and discussed uh, the transgender housing unit, that was at a time when we had um, our THU unit and our male facility. Since then we've moved them to the female facility. So some of the conversations and discussions that we learned and heard about, we were able to integrate into what we do today. Um, but we, we are open to talking about how we um, do a, work more with the advocates and, and establish some sort of process to communicate and even if it's, it's informally setting up uh, regularly scheduled meetings, we're open well, to I, I just want to take a step back though. I, now we're talking about something uh, different. I think one is about having formal input into the processes that, that end up and the operations without, you know, I understand the concern about making that uh, making that a, a uh, making, making policy versus advising. I understand that concern. But the, but the, in your directive, you have it, I mean, it's stated appeals process for housing through an advisory committee that you're saying it sounds like doesn't exist. 
We're also here with a piece of legislation today asking for an appeals process, and the agency is saying that you are working on one. But it seems, I, I, and I'm just raising a, what I think is a, which is a point from this directive, which is that you don't have an appeals process. Is that correct? And but but your directive says there is one. I mean, your directive seems to state there is one, and if a person, an inmate, wants to appeal their their housing based on a rejection, that there's a committee to to do that. Right. So uh, right now we're um, we're still our appeals process is um, under development, and we are trying we're exploring what it ha what the process is going to look like. And we, in terms of having a committee that has another layer of review, we're happy to work and talk further with the council about what that appeals process looks like. Uh, at, in terms of, I guess I, I was thinking advisory committee outside of the department. I don't think that's what we were thinking. But um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm I, I was talking about like an advisory committee to help inform policies. Uh, going beyond the topic of sort of uh, committees that are established here in the Department of Corrections, um, my, my, my question was whether there was this appeals process that was set up for it. Uh, my legislation in the council today actually allows for an appeals process, but we're, but we're actually five years past when you have a past directive that says, uh, you have an instituted directive that says you would do that on your own. You don't have one today, and you're asking us for more time to set up one and, and to work with us on the legislation. It just begs the question about why there isn't one in place today. If there was a kind of an agreed upon uh, uh, idea here that uh, that there should be a process for an inmate to be able to appeal their housing. My understanding is we do have an appeals process in place right now. It's just not as robust as the proposed legislation. Um, so. Um, so we, we do have an existing appeals process. Can you tell us what the appeals process is today? It's very general in that a person can, um, once denied, they can seek reconsideration, and then um, an evaluation is, is done of that person's um, appeal. And Who um, does the evaluation? Uh, the PREA unit will do that evaluation. Who does? The PREA unit will do that evaluation. And, and who does the original? The, who? Same, the PREA unit. So the same people that make the decision we re review and do the well I would say that, um, that that's a fair point and that is something that we are looking into in terms of how we develop and we are happy to work with the City Council again to talk about what that would look like um, but we did one and what I would also add is that this is a new unit um, we started um, housing um, consistent with gender identity in October of this year we, there are a lot of lessons learned there's a lot that we're developing we're pretty much the leaders and there's really no roadmap on how to do this. So we are trying our best to take lessons learned and improve and constantly um, do better. So we, we, and we learn a lot from operationally on when we start a process in place that's even basic, we then learn about what the needs are and how we can improve. So that's, that's our goal is always to improve. I understand that. I mean, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just holding a 2014, from December 3rd, 2014, uh, directive around change the housing unit that talks about an appeals process that doesn't exist today. And it begs the question whether you are taking it seriously enough. If you're not willing to put that in place, you're having the existing people who are reviewing it do the appeals process and then coming to the council and asking you know, whether to work with us on a process that we're asking, that we're ourselves trying to set up. And, you know, for, for, um, for any individual who's raised concerns to us, it does, it does make us look as a city, as a city as a whole, and, but certainly a department, Look like we're not taking this issue seriously. If we're, if the if the sort of the testimony today is we're working on it, because then we'll be here next year and we'll have another hearing on this and potentially not be anywhere absent passing legislation to do something about it. Well, um, I think um, what I would also add is that we the department is adding a director for the LGBTQI community to um, come to the department. They would be this individual once um, on board uh, may also play a role. So as I said again. We are constantly evolving, and we are trying to um, be a leader in um, housing consistent with gender identity. Um, the appeals process is one piece and one layer to this, and we continue to hope to um, do better, and we are going to work on this and create a more robust appeals process. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to move on, but I uh, actually I'm going to I want to go into housing and intake some more, but I will um, I'm going to just ha let, allow my colleagues an opportunity to ask some questions, um, and we're going to start I think with uh, Council Member Rivera. Hi, thank you, Chair Powers. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. 
Um, I have a couple questions uh, uh, about healthcare. And we had a very good conversation at a previous hearing along with Council Member Powers about sick call and producing people that are detained or who are uh, currently incarcerated into receiving, uh, to receive healthcare services. And there were some issues with how they were labeled and the delays, and we were very disappointed with the process overall, but we know that you committed to doing your best and, and, and we believe that uh, CHS truly is trying to do that with the resources available. In terms of the challenges with sick call and some of the problems that we identified, when it comes to our TG and CNB um, population, our community, some of them have long-term health care issues that have to be addressed. And I know that we received this uh, policy on transgender care, but how are you addressing some of those long-term health issues? And if you could talk a little bit about hormone replacement therapy and what you're providing and, and whether or not it's enough, because clearly we want to be able to advocate for more resources. Correctional Health Services. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Not that heavy. Um, Correctional Health Services provides care to all our patients based on their individual clinical needs. Um, factors like uh, the personal characteristics, including gender identity, don't don't factor into the care that we provide unless it affects the course of treatment. Um, certainly, in terms of housing, that doesn't that doesn't uh, affect what care they need. Um, so we since we came over to health and hospitals and became the direct provider of care in 2016 we did consult with experts we we revised the i hope you have the, the current stand right so we revised it um, november 5th of 2018 the policy um, it includes a range of, of care for transgendered persons um, ranging from hormonal therapy to post-surgical care um, we have obviously um, the specialists available at bellevue and elmhurst as well as the resources of health and hospitals, including in their advanced training certificate, with our, which our staff undergo. Um, but, um, and Dr. McDonald, who's our chief medical officer, very strongly believes, as do the, <coughs> the service itself, that um, to improve and maximize access to transgender care, that this should be part of the, the, the armament of every primary care provider in the jail, um, rather than relying solely on specialists, so, so maximum access is available, so that every primary care provider knows how to counsel, monitor, and manage the care of, of persons. It, during the hearing, we saw that a number of inmates were, uh, in quote, not produced by DOC. And so that number was um, very con concerning. Do you have any numbers specifically on people that identify as TGNCNB in terms of not produced? Because when it comes to something like hormone replacement therapy, the consistency there, along with a number of issues. And I'll ask you about um, mental health and people in, in observation units. Are you, do you have those numbers specifically for why they're not being produced? Uh, we currently do not. And again, we're not, we're not tracking uh, patients by their gender identity. Um, we are aware of the production issues. We continue to work with the department um, to improve that. Um, I think there are efforts currently underway um, with council um, to have the department um, report uh, more robustly the, the underlying reasons under production and non-production. And people that are in the, the THU, do they have access to detox treatment or do they have total access in, in terms of whether they have to transition um, and, and they qualify for a mental observation unit? and? And w I'm just trying to get an idea that, that all of these um, important services are, are available considering, I think, what a, an alarming conversation was had about sick call and about identifying an individual's needs. And then what I felt was a bit problematic was the discretion of DOC having to produce that person and then us not r having like real information and details. Yeah. Um, patients who have serious, uh, serious it, health issues, um, whether physical or mental, um, are generally not, not in the THU. They're in the clinical therapeutic housing areas. 
Okay, so um, I just want to, um, well, thank you, Chair, for, for the amount of time that you've given me, but I just want to um, be clear that, you know, we have every intention of, of, of diving a little bit deeper into this issue and, and talking on um, transgender, transgender care specifically and to potentially have a follow-up hearing. Okay, and, and, and thank you all for being here and for offering your testimony. Um, this is something that's incredibly important to us and, and I'm looking forward to hearing from the advocates today. Great, thank you for that. I think the next up is Councilmember Holden and then Councilmember John. Um, thank you for your testimony. Um, one, I have a couple of questions. You gotta give me a little more advance notice next time. <laughs> Can I we ask one to, more question? We can, yes. Right, you, we'll yeah, give Bob You're preparing, Bob? Okay, great. Uh, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the, the I, I heard, and, and forgive me if I uh, didn't hear the answer, about the, like, the advisory committee and some of the advocates that you consult with. How often does that happen? Specific to the gender health and by gender identity. You mentioned that it happened and then you're in constant communication, but I wasn't sure if there was a consistent schedule for how often you meet with some of the advocates and people who hopefully will influence and impact for the better your healthcare policy. So currently we, we don't have a consistent schedule um, as it relates to advocates to speak particularly about um, THU. Um, however, we are expanding our reach and you know, we're, we're um, open to, to Kind of structuring that process um, to make it better, um, but we are constantly in contact with um, experts in the field for LGBTI issues, and we constantly get feedback um, with them. Okay, I, w I would you know just encourage you that they're all experts because not only do they have lived experiences, but they this is their lifetime you know, vocation, this is their, their goal is to be great advocates for, and for equality. And, and the last question was about, you know, in your testimony, you mentioned that the department successfully trained over 10,000 DOC staff on PREA. How many staff are there overall in the Department of Corrections? Right now, I believe we're almost, almost a almost little, little under 12. Yes, a little under 12,000. 12,000, and how often does the training take place? Definitely on a monthly basis. We have two different trainings happening. We have the initial four hour PREA training required by the PREA standards and the DOC minimum standards. And we also have the two hour refresher that's also required by, by both standards. So each person is obligated to take the training, the initial longer training, and then a refresher every month? Every two, no, every two years. Is, Every two years. Yes. Just want to make sure that I was hearing that correctly. Yeah, I get the monthly, monthly thing trainings. is like an open yeah. training where people can walk in. No, no, no. no. The monthly training is yeah. going on so that everyone in the department has the initial training. So we do that on a monthly basis to capture everyone. And then on a monthly basis, we also have the two hour refresher because individuals who are already in their two year anniversary have to now do the two hour refresher. Okay. All right. Um, and every two years. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Thank you for the, the extra time. Yep, thank you. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> um, the voluntary discharge form, um, could you give us an idea of the timeline? So if somebody submits that on a Monday, will they get it reviewed a couple of days, three days, ten days? What, what's the timeline on that? It's, it's almost can, you, can you use the microphone? Sorry, oh, sorry. sorry. Just for sorry. It's, it's almost um, immediate, so it depends. Um, it's a case-by-case -case, uh, analysis, but we have 24 hours to, to review it. We might have to receive additional information that will require an additional time, but within 24 hours, we try to make a determination. So who reviews it? The PREA unit reviews it? Yes. And, and it's usually immediate, you said? Yes. Okay. Um, I just have a, an intro, um, I guess it's 1535. Um, you said the meeting, that, that you had an informal meeting in November or December of last year um, with the review committee. Um, is, is that right? I believe it, uh, please don't hold me to that. I'm not sure, I believe see, it. See, that's, but that's the, best, that's the best reason to have, to formalize this. Like I agree with the chair's remarks, 
that since we don't know exactly when it took place, that we should have it formalized and have a unit um, actually overseeing this from outside, not only inside uh, Department of uh, Corrections, but outside health professionals and so forth. Reviewing this, whether it's quarterly, but they set up regular meetings to review it, and that, that actually makes the, makes the unit even better. So I would, I would say that you should want this legislation, you should agree with it, because it would help formalize it. And it sounds like that it's not. So we, we agree that that's a great idea, and that is something that we're you know, going to work to um, develop and, and really try our best efforts to start putting something together that's more formalized, because we do understand the value that they bring um, to us as correctional professionals, and we want to make sure we're doing our best efforts. So, so we, you, we you're going to support the 1535 intro? Well, we will support <laughs> uh, formalizing um, a more consistent um, uh, way to meet with our advocates in the community um, in order for us to really take well, the value. So you should bring. support this because this does formalize it. You haven't. And I, if it's. Yeah, I, I, um, we, um, again, I think that what we, we would just um, restate what we um, articulated earlier, which is that we uh, don't support a formalized um, through legislation process, but we are willing to open up and talk about what um, a more formal um, internal process would be within the department to be able to meet more regularly with the advocates and to hear their concerns. But we, we uh, reiterate our concerns about um, the makeup of such a task force with not being correctional experts in the field. Um, we also have to navigate. But there are some correctional experts in the task force. It's not, every, it's not totally outside correction. So you'd have people sitting at the table, but I think that, that feedback um, some, some discussion is important to, to improve, because you always need somebody from the outside looking in sometimes to actually well, I, help. I, I, would not, I would not disagree that getting feedback is, hasn't, is helpful, because in fact, that's why we are where we are today. Um, we've been able to do this on, the, on our own. The department is a leader. Um, we are well beyond and ahead of many other uh, jails in the country. And so that is because we've listened and um, taken into consideration what people have um, shared with us, and um, we feel very proud of that. Um, we, the department, made its own decision to transfer the transgender housing unit from the male facility to a female facility. That has facilitated our ability to provide programming and to address the concerns that were raised by the advocates. And I think, um, so we're very proud of that, and we feel that we, um, we're, we're happy to talk further about how we can formalize an internal process to make regularly, more regularly scheduled meetings. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We now have a council member drum. Thank you very much, and um, I'm very disappointed to hear that you're not supporting my resolution on HALT, but I figured you probably wouldn't because you're constantly asking for uh, variances to the um, segregated housing uh, regulations, and so that really does not surprise me. I'm, I'm, I am glad to see that you've reduced the numbers, uh, and certainly I am glad and took an active role in helping to eliminate uh, solitary for the younger people, um, but I'm, I, I am disappointed, to be honest with you, that you still don't uh, see um, solitary confinement as torture. Um, so that is very concerning to me. Uh, that being said, um, when, um, when, when somebody is brought into um, DOC as a detainee, uh, is their sexual orientation or gender identity asked, um, evaluated at intake? Yes, sir. So you have, you have a record of all LGBT transgender people that come into the, uh, your... Um, so, so everyone who identifies, yes. Um, all, anyone who comes through our intake process goes through the same risk screening and we are able to identify them through those questions. And do you have those numbers? I'm sorry? Do you have like a, 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 a total of those numbers? Do you have those numbers with you today? Um, How many there are? For each. For, for each category, for LGBT, how do you identify it? Is there a sheet, or what, what, how is that done? I'm just trying to get an understanding of how it is that you go about identifying these individuals. So that information is tracked through our prior risk screening, um, and they, um, um, at, at, on the risk screening, they state which, um, in, which gender they identify as, and we track it through our prior risk screening. And but what about for LG, LGBT? 
lesbian, gay, bisexual. Do you track that? Do we track that? So we, we, anyone who identifies in that classification, we track. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex. So how many detainees last year, for example, would you have had that identified as LGBT? So we've been using the PREA risk screening instrument since 2015? Since 2016. So over the last two, at least two to three years, we've been tracking that information. But how many? I, you say in your testimony you had 115 applications for the transgender housing unit, but what about for the other groups? So those numbers, um, as far as the applications total, that's from October 2018. And we only brought the, the numbers from when we um, have moved the housing unit to Rosie's. For the other, um, I, let me just say that I think because of this, the topic of this hearing is about the um, housing with gender identity and in particular transgender um, and intersex, we are able to provide information about um, those placements in terms of the um, other um, individuals who identify as lesbian, gay, um, bisexual, um, we, we can get back to you with information. Okay, I, I really would like that, and um, I don't think they're all that separate, to be honest with you, uh, and especially since you brought it up in your uh, testimony, I just would have thought you would have been, um, you know, ready to answer that question. Um, how many um, people? Excuse yep. me, excuse me, Councilman um, Jerome. We actually do have those numbers, and we'd like to provide them have, for you. I have current. Okay, good. For you, I don't have how many? I'm sorry, I keep doing. I'm so sorry. I don't have the numbers of how many in the last year, but I have the current numbers. If you would like me to give you those numbers. Sure. So currently, uh, and these are individuals from this risk screening tool who identified to us. We have 39 individuals who identified as bisexual. We have 26 who identified as, as gay. Uh, three who identified as gender non-conforming. 27 who identified as, as lesbian. And we have transgender female, 47, and transgender male, three. And no gay, did you say gay? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. How many gay? 26. Okay, good, thank you. That's what I was trying to get at, I appreciate it, all right. Um, now, on the advisory committees, are there LGBTQ people? Like, are there, since you're saying that it's not made up of advocates or there are no advocates on it, do you have any LGBTQ people either on the THU advisory committee or on the PREA committee? On our, on our new, in our new directive that we're, we're advising now, it's, it's, it's currently in, in draft form, we will have, um, like uh, um, Ms. Grossman said, we have a director mm -hmm. of LGBTQI um, affairs who can speak to that and give us some good guidance as far as the, the community is concerned, um, and that individual will be, will be part of the advisory committee. Okay, so when uh, somebody is in committee, sorry. when somebody is asking for placement in transgender housing unit, um, how long does it take to process that request? We usually we have um, I believe we give ourselves seventy two hours, but it really depends. We usually try to do it within twenty four hours unless there's additional information that we need to look into um, and and retrieve, or if an uh, individual request to be in the transgender housing unit, and let's say um, they're out to court, that might delay the process if we need to speak to them or something like that. But we give ourselves 72, but we try to do it between 24 and 48 hours. Okay, so then the 50, excuse me, the 12 individuals who were discharged before assessment yes. would have been discharged before, what, 24 or 72 hours, somewhere in that range? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, how many co corrections officers and administrators at DOC are transgender or um, LGB? We did not bring the numbers. Well, you're talking about staff, right, sir? Staff. Yes, we didn't bring the, the numbers for, for but staff. But you do who collect identify. that information? Do, you, do we have the information? No, do you collect that information? I'm not sure. We, we at the PREA unit do not because the PREA unit focuses on the um, inmate on inmate population and staff on inmate allegation population, so we don't collect that. Okay, so that would be interesting to know if, um, if uh, DOC does collect that at time of employment. Um, and what type of special programming do you have 
for transgender individuals um, in Rosie or even in other areas? So our transgender um, incarcerated citizens are completely um, integrated into the Rosie's facility. So all the programs that are available to cisgender women are offered to our transgender um, women. Um, they also, in addition to that, get some specialized programming. Um, they have the, um, it's the ICANN program, which provides um, healthy relationships, gets them prepared for work readiness, provides um, literacy, health and wellness training, um, any relapse prevention if someone has a history of substance abuse, and they also offer additional trauma-focused um, programs specifically for our, our transgender women. And what about for younger inmates, uh, in, younger detainees, both I guess? Um, do they have an opportunity to go to school or how does that work? Yeah, so, yeah. So, um, our 18 to 21 year olds have the opportunity if they so choose to go to school. Okay, and what about and anybody younger than that? 16 They're and 17 year olds who uh, are in our adolescent um, at, at Horizon, uh, they, have an op they go to school every day as well. They go to They're school mandated every day. to go to school. Okay, and just let me also ask about in, the, in this um, directive, I guess it was titled, uh, dated um, 12 3 14. Um, it says that the Transgender Housing Unit THU Advisory Committee shall meet monthly. Does that occur? Not, not currently, sir. It does not. So this directive is not being followed? So the directive is being revised um, currently um, as we speak, and we're sharing that directive uh, with members of the BOC to you know, improve upon that directive. Um, we've been sharing, we've been working with our partners at CCHR um, regarding the directive. And what I will say again and reiterate is that as, as we've discussed, October we um, opened, um, we started housing consistent with gender identity. Uh, so whatever, so policies and um, work that we're working on, we're constantly improving and we always see a need to, sometimes we see a need to, to revise and improve upon um, policies that were dated from December. We have a lot of lessons learned between December and now and we're trying to operationalize and improve the policies. So that's why we're constantly trying to incorporate feedback from um, the community and from uh, other stakeholders who are interested so that we can improve and enhance the existing directive. Okay, because here it also says in the same sentence, the THU Advisory Committee shall meet monthly. Meetings shall be chaired by the Deputy Commissioner of Strategic Planning and Programs. The Advisory Committee can make recommendations on reconsideration requests for placement in THU. However, only the THU Evaluation Committee can make a placement determination. That's still true? Is, or is it PREA? I'm confused. No, it's the PREA. Yeah. So there has been Thank you. There has been a, a lot of changes as far as, as the staff as well uh, since that policy has come into ex existence. And we've learned a lot of things, again, from the advocates on how to improve the process. And what we did not do was put it in, in written form yet. And so that's what we're doing now to include housing by gender identity. But we've Although it's not in writing, we have improved our practices um, and not necessarily in writing our policies. When do you expect to put it in writing? It's in draft form. We are still um, receiving information from stakeholders and, and advocates. Our goal is to um, finalize this um, as soon as we can. So we recognize the need to have a final written policy and that is our goal. Um, and we're continuing to work to make sure that it's a good policy that it incorporates all the concerns, uh, so that way we don't have to go back and keep revising. So, that okay, would be our thank goal. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thanks for those questions. Um, just a couple follow-up questions on this as well. Um, I think you said, what, can you just give us the numbers on the um, how many transgender individuals are in custody today? Sure. Um, in custody, our transgender population would be, sorry, would be 50. That would include three uh, of our transgender males. Gotcha. And how many available beds do you have or in the THU unit? 50. 50? Yes. 
So you're at capacity. So if no, 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 no. no. So we have our transgender population. Oh, not everybody's in the THU, right? right. Do, you, well, do you want the numbers for who's in the how many in the THU? Yes. We have 13 currently in in THU, and I'm sorry, these numbers are as of of yes. Monday, Monday's numbers. Um, this 13 currently in THU. We have eight in general population and two in the new admission housing unit. So that's 23 and you have another 27 that are? Three of our transgender, the transgender males that we have. Oh, right, right. They're, yeah. at, they're at Rosie's and we have outside of Rosie's in protective custody, we have 13 of our transgender women Okay. And in other facilities, other than protective custody, there's 11. Okay. Um, so you have you've 13 in THU, you have 50 beds, and you have 20, 37 others that are, uh, some are, um, the, the, the men are in the, men, I assume men, on male facility. But if, if um, I just want to get a better understanding of, um, of, the, you know, there's been some concerns that have been raised to us that in some cases that the housing is part of a convert, you know, is can be uh, a, a, a punitive uh, or a reward even in terms of uh, individuals' behavior. Can you share with us just more information about how these decisions are getting made in terms of the 50 that are today? Obviously, I understand there's probably some sensitive information in here, but um, how you get to the number 13, for instance, today, when um, there seem to be other individuals who could be eligible for THU. And, you know, just addressing the concern that some folks have raised to the council that um, some of these decisions may, could, could be made with a determination of uh, preference to a certain individual or be punitive. Okay. So um, you know, that would definitely be a concern of ours, too. Um, but we, I, I don't believe that um, that is occurring. In fact, our intake staff um, in communicating their options um, to our transgender and intersex um, populations. They encourage um, them to apply to THU. Um, most of what the numbers, the totals for those who are in housing units um, outside of PC other than Rosie's, those transgender women have requested to be placed in male housing. That, that actually was their preference. Um, but acceptance or denial into THU um, is not used as any type of punitive or disciplinary measure for anyone. We encourage um, placement there. Um, and so they're evaluated. We complete our case by, we do a, an individualized assessment case by case. Um, and if they qualify, they are, you know, given their preferred right um, placement, housing placement in THU. And how do you make a decision about who to place in protective custody? So it, it would all depends. Again, um, we, we, do a, we take a holistic approach to that examination. We look at, um, you know, um, our, our pre or screening. We look at um, how they identify. We look at any other security concerns, um, any custody management issues, and we make a determination. And, and we also take um, serious consideration to the person's own perception of their safety. And that's, you know, um, we didn't draw a conclusion of how to best house that individual. Do individuals ever re request it then? If you're saying that there's a concern about their own, their own safety, is there, do people ever request to be? Absolutely. Put yes. Do you know how many today in your population have requested that? Um, I don't have that specific number of who actually requested um, to be placed in PC because of their own um, perception of their okay. risk, but we could we could get that. Can you be transferred out? Can you a, be a protective custody? Um, again, it would it would you know security would definitely have to do an individualized assessment to see if that would be the safest um, decision for someone requesting to be transferred out of PC. And, and so, and may I? I just want to add also um, in that number. Um, out of the 24 individuals, out of the 24 individuals who are not in the female facility, 13 did not want to be considered for the female uh, facility, and 
five were in the female facility and then were removed either based on their request or for other reasons. Okay, thank you for that, thank you for that clarification. Um, how are the applications to THU tracked? We, yes, okay, we have um, the PREA unit has a, a manual database um, in electronic form that we track all of the applications that come uh, through. An electronic form that you track? Yes, okay. yes. Um, and uh, just a final question on housing here. Um, presumably you have to also take in consideration things if there's like a gang affiliation or other considerations about how to house people. So how do you make a decision in that case about whether somebody gets into THU if there are other considerations? I know you're, you're talking about this sort of process you go through, but presumably also there's two individuals, there could be two individuals who have the same thing. Do you put one in and one, and one doesn't get in or how does that, how do you make a decision? So, so again, you know, we, we look at, um, the full spectrum of the information that we have. Um, sometimes it may be necessary to house someone in THU and then someone else in the female general population, but we, we, we give consideration to all of our options before making a decision. I would just add that we work very hard to try to place um, anyone who's transgender intersex in the trans, if they so choose, into the transgender housing unit or alternatively in a general population area in the Rosen Singer Center. So that is our effort, that is our goal, and we try very hard to do that. And then, um, and we, we've seen great success on that. Okay, thank you. I wanted to move just uh, with the CHS for a few questions just about um, healthcare, and I know that Councilmember Rivera touched on some of this, but can you just give us the uh, transgender specific health care that CH provides, just, just to hear it, just to, uh, that CH provides for transgender individuals? Sure. Um, so, um, you know, treating transgender patients uh, with respect is part of our core mission. Uh, we understand um, the the trauma that is often associated with the life history of all of our patients, uh, but in particular, uh, the pathway to jail for, um, for our transgender patients is often one marked by trauma and stigmatization in, in our society. Um, and so really the most important element of the care that we provide is understanding that and respecting those patients uh, and respecting their gender identity. Um, there, um, so we start there with our training uh, for our staff, um, attending to the sensitivity, uh, the appropriate use of preferred gender pronouns, um, and the way that we empathize and interact with our patients. Um, there are details of uh, hormone therapy, which often comes up, um, and we have um, policies that we've developed um, in collaboration with work groups, with experts. Um, but as Dr. Yang mentioned, we also believe strongly that this should be a function of our primary doctors and physician assistants and NPs in our system. We wanna make it a primary care function. It is a core expectation that our staff have expertise and, and the ability um, so that the lack of a provider who knows what they're doing is not a barrier to, to continue. Can you tell us what's the, uh, on the topic of hormone replacement therapy, can you tell us what the standard dosage is? So uh, I just want to um, clarify some critique of earlier policies before the transition to health and hospitals. Um, the un uh, provider uncertainty was identified early on in this process as a barrier. So in many systems around the country, um, people will require community collateral information, which means actual records of community treatment to start somebody on a hormone regimen, or a specialist appointment, which you know, has a process to it that can take weeks as well. So really this, the use of standardized regimens historically was a, designed to eliminate that barrier. So we weren't waiting for those things that would slow down the process before starting medications. We appreciate the critiques of that earlier policy and the development of intercurrent recommendations from expert bodies regarding um, the standards of care for this. Um, so our, our latest policy uh, may have guideline, general guidelines, but it seeks to emphasize 
that the regimens should really be tailored to the individual patients. So there is a standard dosage or not a standard dosage? So there is not a standard dosage that's required for any individual patient, yeah. Okay, and if, um, if okay, okay, thank you. Um, the, and then we've heard, and this I think may have come up earlier uh, in, in some legislation as well, we've heard that people housed in the transit or housed in the THU don't have access to detox treatment. And can you describe what sort of detox treatment you're offering today and um, whether THU has access to that, and if not, if there's a plan to, and what is, what would that look like? Yeah, so the, they do. The THU, Rosie's as a facility, has access to the range of services that we provide, um, including the highest level of mental health care and all of our MAT services. Um, as we've expanded access to MAT generally, we've moved away even from detox towards maintenance when appropriate um, for as many patients as possible, and that's available to anybody who's housed in Rosie's. Okay, thank you for that question, uh, and then that answer. And then uh, final question here, when a transgender person qualifies for a mental observation, observation unit like CAPS or PACE, how does their housing determine? Yeah, so um, this is uh, relatively recent um, that there is no restriction on housing, um, in, and those units are available in Rosie's as well as um, in other facilities across the system. Um, so to be handled on a case-by-case, -case, um, we are do, do have the ability to offer the range of services uh, to a, trans, a transgender person housed in Rosie's. Does a, like, does a transgender woman have the option of being at a CAPS or PACE unit at Rosie's? Yes. And, a, and does a transgender man have the option of being one at a men's facility? Yes, uh, yes. yes. Not okay. to say that these situations have necessarily come up, um, and because of the low numbers, you know, we would like to avoid the details of who's in what units, um, but that there, there is no prohibition on that. Yeah. Okay, appreciate it. Um, just on training and sensitivity here, you know, sorry, turn my microphone. In, the, in, in addition to the system-wide changes that have to be made, it obviously there are, I think you had 12,000 employees and staff was, 12,000 staff members was the a number cited earlier, and making sure that that, that the system-wide stuff that we do and the people that are sitting in this room when they're, when they're working on these issues every day, that filters down to every individual's working in the facilities, everything from, um, you know, re reducing misinformation or eliminating misinformation, uh, understanding pro that, that sort of verbiage and pronouns are really, really matter, and, and tackling issues like phobia and, and people's, uh, you know, resistance, um, even in, even as society around has changed. Can you talk to us about the sensitivity, tr sensitivity training that officers are receiving today and, um, and what that process is? I, I, I've had a chance to witness some of it, but I'd like to know sort of comprehensively what the department is doing around training for officers and then for that matter for, for doctors as well. So um, we were working, like I said earlier, very closely with um, a few of the, the advocates who develop the um, sensitivity training for, for staff. And we ensured, I believe, uh, we had almost everyone at the female facility go through the sensitivity training, but definitely staff who would come into contact with our transgender population first. Um, that includes the intake staff or the escort staff at the other facilities, but we try to make sure that everyone in our female facility has that sensitivity training. I think everybody should have that training. Absolutely. And, and the, um, you know, the concern that, that I have and is that um, even beyond just providing training and, I, I, and a video and that I think it's every two year training, that you still have you still have a cultural shift to make in terms of a better understanding of the, the issues that are, are particular to transgender community and that there is, um, even as, I'm just being frank to be frank, even as society has made, I think, significant strides in certain areas around LGBTQ, that not every single one of those letters in there is getting, has the same information understanding and there's still a lot of issues around phobia that exist um, it both in, in the DOC and in other in other parts all around us, and um, you know, particularly for those who are in custody, mm -hmm. that becomes even a, a larger concern and a challenge. 
And um, so just, just to, I want to just, when, when, does you, when do you hire an LGBTQ liaison? They are um, hired, I, yeah. be, I believe they're already hired. Uh, we're just waiting for additional paperwork, so I'm not really sure where we are in that process. And that person will be part of the process of doing the, of, of PREA training and, and training sensitivity and in addition to other issues like meeting with stakeholders. Yeah, we hope to integrate that person into every element as it relates to um, PREA and our, our transgender and intersex um, populations. But I would also just like to add, um, in our PREA trainings that we've been conducting since 2014, 2015, um, the four hour training, there is a, um, a specific model in that training that speaks clearly and extensively about um, gender sensitivity. Um, it provides its definitions for all of the LGBTQIs. It, it talks about equality versus equity. Um, and it really goes into touch the culture so that we understand agency-wide the need um, and the unique needs that, that, that our population may have. What, what is the training today? You go through a four hour and a two hour, is that correct? You so do a you, four hour the initial. initial training is the four hour and then um, biannually, staff get the two hour refresher. But the staff members at Rosie's, of course, they get addition, in addition to that, they get the sensitivity training. What, what is that training? How often and what does it look like? So anyone who's gonna be working um, in um, THU, who's involved in escorts, um, they're provided that training. The PREA unit actually does that training. Uh, one of our supervisors, our captain, does the transgender 101 training, and then there's an additional training that was developed by ACLU that um, specifically goes into even more details about how to keep transgender intersex and they uh, safe in custody. How often do they receive it? Is it one time? They receive it initially when they're, anyone who um, is assigned, anyone who um, gets a new post assignment, and I'm, I'm not certain if that's an, an annual ongoing training, but we can find out if, if that is something that is, is done annually. Okay, we appreciate that. Um, just to go back also, the, the director will be onboarded by next month. He just wants to- Okay, great, thank up. you for that update. Um, also, we, we are incorporating some of that information in the sensitivity training and our refresher training. And annually we have to do, I believe it's given to us by DCAS and we have an obligation like um, everyone who works for the city. Yeah, we have to do a EEO training that includes that information as well. And, and do doctors have to go through any particular training? Do they go through the same training as officers or, or and medical staff for that matter? So CHS in 2018 um, actually worked to develop our own PREA training. Um, and it was an opportunity to include a, a section of that training on, on transgender care. PREA and transgender care obviously are separate issues, uh, but it was an opportunity to reach all of our staff with a mandated training. Um, and so it is incorporated into that training. Um, also, um, since transitioning to health and hospitals, we've leveraged some of the great resources um, that health and hospitals has developed uh, for use across the system, um, including um, having experts from health and hospitals come and give grand rounds, uh, as well as the training materials that they have available. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, do you have any other questions? Okay. Thank, well, so I want to say thank you. Know, thank you. I, th I think you know. I think we recognize that the agency has made strides and is leading in particular areas around it. I think, you know, it does not mean in, in my estimation or my opinion that we should stop there or could not continue to move the city forward and continue to be in the front, not, in, you know, not somewhere in the middle of the pack in terms of large cities and, and, and throughout this country. Um, and I think that, you know, we have some follow-up questions particularly around how to, ha how to incorporate more voices into that process, but particularly also how to actually f have formal processes that we are, we are, we are advertising to be um, in, uh, in effect here. Um, I, you know, it's, it's obviously important as well. We're, we're, we're gonna hear momentarily from, I think some of the advocates and those who are working on issues around um, the criminal justice system. 
Um, but I, you know, I want to I, I, I thank you for the work you, you, you're doing and, and, and where we are today. Um, I think that the legislation is trying to address, that we have before us is trying to address things that we see as, you know, continue efforts to stay um, as leaders in, in here and also to formalize things that seem to be informal around like an appeals process or around getting more information around um, housing and other services that are being provided and to in ensure that in, for Councilman Ayala's bills that everybody is receiving the same and adequate um, and appropriate services. So we will um, follow up with uh, uh, both agencies or, uh, or, or agency and contractor um, uh, or agency, I don't know, but uh, around, um, around the, um, around some of the issues that we have as a follow-up, um, but also would, have, as I always do, encourage folks from CHS and DOC to stick around and hear from the folks that will be testifying after you because you will hear, I'm sure, other ideas and, uh, and opinions as well. So, well, thank you. Thanks. We'll take a quick second and we'll invite others up here now. Um, we are gonna hear our next panel, um, from Mick, Mick Kincaid from the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, Deborah Lolai from the Bronx Defenders, Kelsey Di Diavola from Brooklyn Defender Services, and Kayla Simpson from the Legal Aid Society. All right, thank you. We're going to continue now with our next panel. Uh, the we don't have to swear you in, but um, we we are going to have just because we have a long list of groups, we're going to have some uh, a, some clock limitations here, uh, and we'll have an opportunity to ask questions and follow up questions after as well. Um, so we'll go from my right this way, uh, starting. And uh, if you can just before you testify, just state your name and you're the group that you're affiliated with, and then you can start your testimony, and they'll have you on the clock, but we'll have an opportunity to ask questions as well. This is, oh, there we go. Um, my name is Mick Kincaid. I am the director of the Prisoner Justice Project at the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. Um, I want to thank you for having this and also for moving it from the 30th so that more of us could attend. I didn't submit prepared comments today, um, and in part that's because I wasn't sure what the Department of Corrections was going to say, and so I wanted to have more freedom to just respond. Um, and in that, I wanted to say that I, um, th last month at the Board of Corrections PREA hearing, there was a lot of confusion around the difference between uh, transgender identity and sexuality, um, and around the Prison Rape Elimination Act itself as a whole, and then the specific treatments of trans, gender nonconforming, and intersex people. Uh, there seems to be a lot of conflation between transgender people, gender nonconforming people, and intersex people, and in part this is because of the lack of definitions in the law. Um, there are definitions in various different laws, but from between the city to the federal, it changes significantly, and it's very unclear who these laws apply to. Um, so for instance, uh, at the Board of Corrections hearing, the uh, DOC continued to talk about the transgender and intersex housing. Um, however, I, there's nothing on paper that says that intersex individuals, unless they also identify as transgender, are allowed into the housing unit. Um, and in addition, the current directive, which is a private and not allowed to be shared with uh, individuals in the community or advocates, uh, has no placement for transgender men. And transgender men, in general, um, don't seem to be 
considered in a lot of this. Uh, the three men who are at Rose during the Board of Corrections testimony were counted as women. Um, and there seems to be an ongoing concern that the Department of Corrections doesn't actually know the difference between transgender men and transgender women. Um, in addition, when the department was telling you about the eight transgender women in general population, I want to be clear that those women are in another unit altogether. So they're in a unit that allows for transgender women and cisgender women 50 and older. So I think there's a lot of clarity issues. Um, and in addition, I just want to point out that uh, the three men at RMSC, I don't believe at any point in time today the department said where they were housed, just that they were at Rose. They're all in protective custody or isolated confinement of some kind. So I, there's a lot of general statements that I think we need to ask more specifics about because they don't go into these when they talk about them. So for instance, the four-hour pre training, there's no specifics what they said about like what part of that is about transgender people in particular. I sat through a version of it two years ago, and there was no particular part of it that was about transgender identity or LGB identity at all. Can you just ask a follow-up question? Um, and thank you for that. And thank you for your flexible flexibility in terms of uh, uh, the testimony. Um, you talked about inconsistency of definitions uh, between federal, city, probably, I don't know, I don't know yeah. state factors in that as well. Is there a definition, do you, do you, is there in the conflict between the city and the state do you see a definitional preference in terms of uh, the, the law and, and, and which one is, you feel like, more adequate? I don't think that either has a fantastic version. Um, I think it just needs to be more clear throughout. So, for instance, under the Prison Rape Elimination Act, there are definitions of intersex and transgender, um, and then there are specific things that apply to transgender people and intersex people, but then gender nonconforming people aren't included in there. But then the city has use the term gender nonconforming and some of the specific minimum standards, but they're not reflected in the directive then. So there seems to just be an inconsistent use and we need to figure out if we want the transgender housing unit and if we want transgender-based placement to be inclusive of all people who um, identify as a sex or a gender other than that which they were born with, um, or if we only want it to be people who transition on a binary. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that needs to be a decision that's made and then clearly shared with people because there's no, there's no clarity. That's, good. That's a great point. Um, and, and on training, have you ever sat through any of the PREA trainings? Yeah, so I sat through one um, in 2016, I believe. Um, and then I'm supposed to have one, an, another one because I'm a volunteer. I go to RMSC every week. I'm supposed to have had a training, but I haven't. You're required to, you're required to get one. Yeah. Did, you, did you feel like they were adequate? No, I think that the entire training was about how um, people in incarceration are tricky and will try to have sex with you. <laughs> um, I have no follow-up questions. Good morning, um, or afternoon, I'm not sure. <laughs> Good morning. Um, my name is Deborah Lalloy. I am a criminal defense attorney and the LGBTQ client specialist at the Bronx Defenders. Um, as part of my role at the Bronx Defenders, I represent hundreds of transgender people in criminal cases every year, many of whom are or were incarcerated pretrial. Um, I testified before some of you in September of 2018 on this issue, um, and as has been acknowledged already today, there have been improvements since then, primarily with the move of the THU to Rosam Singer Center. Um, it's definitely been a lot better, but we are far from where we need to be. Um, since the department was, has supposed to been housing people uh, according to gender identity from October 2018, um, I have to say, uh, contrary to, to what has already been testified to, that is not happening. The majority of transgender women specifically who I represent who have been incarcerated since that date have been in a male facility. And again, contrary to what has been testified to, they are not there by choice. They are there because they were either rejected from the THU, they were discouraged from applying to the THU, they were kicked out of the THU, or they didn't want to be in the THU, they wanted to be in general population at Rose M. Singer Center, which is, again, contrary to what has been said, is not an option. Um, and the other way that people end up in male facilities is when they have, uh, as the council has talked about already today, uh, when they have serious medical issues that they need medical attention for or serious mental health issues or um, 
drug, very intense drug treatment that they need. It was said today that those services, people in the THU have access to those services, but I just want to be clear that women in the THU don't have access to those services at Rosem Singer Center. If they need those services, they're going to the male facility. Um, I, I know I'm out of time. Uh, I submitted written testimony that, that includes a lot more suggestions and concerns that I have. Um, so I would ask that that be reviewed. But, but what I want to end with is that I, we support all of the bills that, that are being introduced um, related to, to this topic. I don't think any of these issues that I outlined for you in, in my testimony can be addressed until the department actually starts to see transgender women as women and starts actually placing them in general population with cisgender women if that's what they want. Um, and, and again, the Bronx Defender supports all the bills on the table today. Thank you for that. Can I just ask one follow-up question to you? How are, can you describe any particular processes by where you've heard what the, or, what, or how they were discouraged from applying to THU? Yeah, so on multiple occasions, um, I have heard from clients that at intake, they were told not to apply to the THU because it's too catty in there, um, because they're not gonna like it in there. Uh, I also have had experiences, I'm specifically thinking of one client who I had, um, who was initially in the THU, she reported being sexually harassed in the THU and was then removed forcibly after being pepper sprayed um, and put in a male facility after basically begging the department to place her back in any women's facility. And she was even willing to go into uh, solitary confinement in a women's facility because of the assault she was experiencing in a men's facility. She was approached by a PREA representative who told her she should not go to Rose M. Singer Center because she's actually, as bad as it is where she was then in the male facility, it's much worse in general population at Rose M. Singer Center. So that's just one story. Got it, thank you, thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. Uh, good morning, my name's Kayla Simpson. I'm a staff attorney at the Prisoner's Rights Project at the Legal Aid Society. Thank you so much um, for having this hearing and for, for hearing us. And thank you to my fellow advocates who uh, made points that will save me time. Um, I join their testimony. Um, we also continue to hear from trans women who want to be in the THU but are removed for seemingly minor incidents. Um, and instead of being housed at Rose, they languish in men's jails where they tell us, of course, that they're subject to continual harassment. Um, and I want to focus uh, specifically on one thing that we, we continue to hear in these hearings about how DOC makes housing decisions. Um, it is still not clear, obviously, to us as a, an advocate community or to our clients uh, what the criteria are, and um, DOC has been saying that they have in draft form those written policies and procedures for nearly a year, by my recollection, um, and we look forward to seeing those. Um, but. The primary reason that DOC gives, at least to us, and I think to, to other members of our community, for denying our clients gender consistent housing is a claim of dangerousness. Um, but we're very concerned about how DOC assesses that factor. Um, we don't know if they take into consideration how recent that behavior was, the fact that trans people are often forced into conflict because of a dangerous environment and defend themselves. Is that assessed against them for gender consistent housing? Um, we certainly support the PREA standards, um, but we're concerned that PREA is often used as a sword to deny gender consistent housing. And a security, uh, a security expert recently told us, there's no reason that a person cannot be housed consistent with gender identity unless they pose a risk to the safety of persons of the same gender identity, so gender-based violence. And the point is, I think, when cisgender women have behavioral issues, when they act violently, when they show abusive behavior, it certainly happens, the department doesn't move them to men's facilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just because someone has a behavioral issue doesn't mean the department shouldn't still house them consistent with their gender identity. 
Um, and that concern drives some of our written comments that we made. And I just want to say really quickly that we support very strongly the two resolutions before the committee. Legal Aid staff were actually in Albany yesterday encouraging the passage of HALT um, and, and MAT uh, uh, intro 1514 uh, MAT we believe is the standard of care for opiate addiction. Should be available to everybody and every facility regardless of gender identity. Thank you for the council's leadership. Just a follow up question for yes. you. Are, are, the, are the pieces of legislation that we're considering today in your experience at the BOC hearing or in prior practice, are those things that the, the DOC has stated are currently occurring, meaning it's codifying existing practice? The, the, fi the f all five the bill, yeah. Um, yes, I think, I think they would say that they are, that they're currently in practice. I think that is out of line with the reality of what we're hearing from people. Got it. Great. Thank, Thank you. you for the testimony. Hello, good morning. <clears throat> My name is Kelsey Diavila. I'm the project director of jail services at Brooklyn Defender Services. And um, I'm basically going to say everything that's already been said, but I'll try to say it in a different way. <laughs> um, so first off, I mean, I, I would like to thank you all for um, moving the, t uh, the hearing to today, because uh, we were also in, in Albany um, advocating for HALT. Um, in addition, just wanted to say thank you for asking um, some pretty direct questions to the department that, I mean, I think to all of us were pretty simple to answer, but, you know, we found out that what we kind of already knew, that uh, there, was, there was a lot of confusion. Um, there's, you know, there's really no process. I'm not really sure what rules they are following, if any. Um, you know, their directive is the one that I've seen, 2014 directive, and we assume that's what they're following, but it's pretty clear that they're not, and, you know, I think that's really worrisome, and it's harmful to our clients and the people in our jails. Um, you know, I, there's so many times where people will, they've asked for THU, they've applied to THU, and they're being denied for arbitrary reasons. Um, one example is we had a woman who um, was in the THU and she was sentenced um, to a city year and the next day when she got back from court, uh, DOC removed her from THU and put her in a male facility. Um, I reached out to the only person I know is um, our the assistant commissioner, Faye Lardy, and the response was that because she's sentenced, she wasn't allowed to be in THU. Well, in the directive, it doesn't say anything about being sentenced and in addition, there are a number of sentenced women who are in THU. So, how are these decisions being made? And yeah, I mean, what's the criteria? And so I think, you know, depending on, they talk about case by case basis, but like it's, there's no following order. Like it's, it's a lot of confusion and it's difficult for us to advocate for our clients. Um, you know, in addition, um, I think it was already been said about behavior being used against a person. Um, we had a, a, a fairly, a young woman um, in early twenties who uh, she applied for for THU, uh, waited over a month for a response, and when we reached out to uh, the department, they said it was her behavior. Well, when she applied, she was like, you know, within the 24 hours, and the behavior that they were talking about was how she was trying to defend herself from the assault, the physical assault and the sexual assault that she endured during that month period of waiting, and they used it against her to not apply, for not be able to uh, in the THU. Um, I mean, there's a lot more I have to say. Uh, please read our written testimony. Um, I just want to make one more point, is that you know, we need to ensure that the department's leadership is not compromised by any personal biases relating to uh, transgender and gender nonconforming people. Uh, we need to be mindful of how the department creates and enacts policies meant to protect and safely house them. Um, so thank you for your time. Great, thank you. I think Councilmember Holden, did you have a question? Yes, um, Department of Corrections testimony that they act on these applications for housing immediately, 24 hours. You, you, none of you have seen that. I, so I, just quickly, so I go to the THU to teach a class uh, twice a month and I go to the THUI the other two weeks. So I'm at RMSC in one of the THUs every single week. None of the women who are currently in either of them were processed within 24 hours. Uh, I routinely ask every time a new person comes in, how did you get here? And their answers are either, I don't know, I was in a men's jail, I was complaining, and then all of a sudden I got moved here, but it happened like between three to six weeks, and it wasn't, they don't believe it was their complaints, they believe either their attorney or the judge intervened, um, or there are women who um, have come back from parole and have been placed there within the 24 hours because they were there previously, and when they defaulted on parole were placed back in there, but none of the women who are newly sentenced were placed within 24 hours. I, um, it's, it's very rare that I have a client who is placed in the THU that wants to be in the THU within 24 hours. 
I actually don't know if it's ever happened. Um, but what I will say is that it seems to me from <clears throat> patterns that I've been seeing that the department very largely determines their decision based on how femininely a woman presents. And that's extremely problematic. And in fact, it's the basis for many of my clients' rejections. And what the department will, um, they have literally said this to me, we believe your client's pretending to be transgender. Um, and let me be clear, none of my clients have been pretending to be transgender. They are all transgender. Um, so, so I think, again, this sort of speaks to the lack of transparency about how these decisions are made within the department, but I do see a trend in terms of when a transgender client who is a woman presents more femininely, they usually get in a lot faster. Thank you, all right. Great, thank you for all your testimony, thanks so much, and your input prior to the hearing as well. Thank you. Uh, our next panel, we're gonna have a, actually do a five-person panel. Uh, it's Mariah Lopez, Nancy Sicardo, Curtis Bell, Donna Hilton, and I can't read this name, but it's Vincent, oh, oh Shirali from uh, Columbia University. Thank you, we'll start uh, from same, we'll start over here, yep. Good morning, thank you. I'm testifying on the um, resolution on the Less Is More Act. I'm the co-director of the Columbia University Justice Lab, former commissioner of New York City probation. I'm not gonna read my testimony, I'm just gonna say a couple things and then get out of your way. Great, thank you. Uh, we started probation and parole here in the United States. Parole was actually started in New York State in the 1870s. It was unabashedly rehabilitative, an attempt to gauge how people did while they were locked up and help them when they got out. Um, that ran smack into the war on drugs and the war on crime and mass incarceration in the 70s and a lot of parole uh, departments pivoted to be very punitive and very surveillance focused. We started wearing guns and flak jackets. We started calling ourselves community corrections, engaging in intermediate sanctions, trying to keep our market share while prisons exploded. Uh, and we did keep our market share in one respect. We've got five times as many people on probation and parole in America than we had back in the 1970s. In another respect, we didn't because nobody ever funded that. So now there are some caseloads that have over 100 people who have legitimate needs for housing, for education, for employment. They carry the stigma of a felony conviction and incarceration. But instead of helping them, what we've done is we've sort of ratcheted up surveillance, ratcheted up the number of conditions that people are required to abide by so that almost no one could abide by those conditions. And what's happened now, particularly in New York State, is that we're revoking people for minor missteps and reincarcerating thousands and thousands of them every year. There's 6,300 locked up in our state facilities in New York, and that is just for non-criminal technical violations of rules like missing appointments. And that costs us hundreds of millions a year. It is thwarting the closure of Rikers Island. It's about one out of every 12 people at Rikers is in for a technical violation. Less is more addresses that by reducing the ability to be technically violated. And hopefully the next step will be capturing some of those savings and putting them into the community so people can thrive rather than just live under the threat of a violation. Thank you. Just one question. You mentioned a stat, but I want to just maybe get a, a clearer number here. As we kind of having this conversation right now about the siting of the new borough-based facilities mm -hmm. for Rikers Island and talk about population size relative to the recent reforms in Albany, 
Can you, do you what, what is the number today that are in on technical parole violations in our city jails? So it's 650 um, on pure technicals and another 800 and change that are locked up on a new offense, but they also have technicals. Right. So it's, it's important that new offense because there's a lot of people in on misdemeanors uh, with a technical parole hold. You don't stay very long in Rikers on a misdemeanor right now. It's like 11 days is the average length to stay. But if you have a parole violation, the average length to stay is 99 days. So about half of the people locked up for a misdemeanor in Rikers are parole violators, or in on parole violations. That means that about 15,000 potential folks on parole are using as many beds as the other 8.6 million of us for misdemeanors in Rikers Islands. It's crazy. Great, thank you for that and that clarification. Thanks so much. Hello. Oh. So my name is Mariah Lopez. I have some slightly prepared remarks, but um, given that there are corrections folk in the back and people from legal aid and even the executive here, um, I'm certainly gonna go over the two minutes, but I'm gonna give context now but as, it's a two minute as to why. Councilman. So I am the executive director of the oldest transgender rights group in the country. And most of my teen years were spent going back and forth to Rikers Island. I was the spokesperson for an Amnesty International report not brought up anywhere in these proceedings that first outlined the issues brought up today in the, in the hearing. Um, before the two minutes runs, and I'm just going to show you that I will address my points regardless, I'm going to give correction a little cover here. So most of the issues that were brought up today could be cured legally, and I'm going to get to why I know my legal stuff in a second, by an executive order. Um, and I'm glad this new wonderful progressive council feels the need to drag corrections in and be moved by this whole progressive community. But the Legal Aid Society Prisoners' Rights Project and many of the corrections folk in the back will tell you that I personally put my body on the line from the years 2006 around till 2009 or 10 when corrections under the pressure of multiple lawsuits from my attorneys and pressures from the community sort of bowed to my experience and decided making case-by-case -case decisions based on my scenario. I'm going to jump to my prepared, prepared remarks, but if you knew Sylvia Rivera and you understand anything of that speech she gave in 1973, when that buzzer buzzes in about five seconds, I'm going to move on and I'm going to read my prepared remarks because that's what's historically necessary this year. So, especially, I, I was hoping Councilman Drom stood here, because if you're not familiar with Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, he was, you should be. So, my name is Mariah Lopez. I'm the executive director of STAR. STAR is the first and oldest trans rights organization in the country. We were founded in the white hot heat of the Stonewall Rebe Rebellion. As we celebrate the 50th anniversary, um, it is important of Stonewall. It is important that we acknowledge and give credit to and honor the work of trans pioneers who got us to where we are. And I'll reference back if both the council and the people in the audience have not seen the clip of Sylvia Rivera at the Pride celebration in 1973 bringing, uh, bringing up prisoners' rights issues, you should watch it. STAR has been consistently advocating on these issues longer than any other organization. As it relates to the, today's proceedings, um, STAR is in favor of most of the resolutions. Um, today, it sort of represents a crossroads in many ways anyway. Um, the council sees fit to prioritize connecting <coughs> corrections in a formal, canonized way to community members, making it policy that corrections and the community work further um, for, you know, to, to on reforms and policy. I make myself available both to corrections and correction health services, um, and I just want to point out the fact that I bring up 2009 and 10 because 
The only thing that, have cha that has changed is political impetus. The legal principles behind the civil rights for transgender people and corrections are the same. The state constitution is the same. The only thing that happened were politics and elections. And so, if you would like me to come back here and never have to go over my time, um, I just recommend that the council pass all the resolutions and stay on top of corrections um, in terms of working with community. Um, and I obviously invite my community members to contact STAR if you know any transgender person that faced abuse while in correction custody. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, council, committee. My name is Nancy Sicardo and I'm here to read my testimony and my truth. My name is Nancy Sicardo, and I am a member of Cattell and a Manhattan resident. I've been incarcerated on Rikers Island and in state prisons, and I've seen enough of the system to know that I do not trust it and it must be completely reformed. Rikers is an unjust facility that strips people, people of color, of their humanity, humanity, why do we have such a place in our city when it's supposed to be progressive and fair? Why? We need to close Rikers and create a system that is fair and brings safety and justice to all of our communities. A system that treats other Nancys like myself and young girls and women with the respect and dignity that we deserved. And just to follow up on that a little, I just wanna, even though it's not on paper, I was personally impacted by this technical violation a couple of years ago. I was violated and sent to prison not knowing what I was violated for, just that it was just dirty urine. I didn't find out till 90 days later that I was violated for eating poppy seeds. Poppy seeds. Less is more is the way to go, and we need to pass this bill today. So I would appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your testimony. Thanks. Curtis Bell, Cattell. This is, <laughs> let me first speak about something that Doc said that they work very well with advocates. I would ask this council that anybody that comes before you saying they work with advocates, because we all stay, we're linked to each other. If one group has a conversation with Docs by five o'clock, everybody has a transcript of it. So that is a lie. They haven't reached out to anybody to organize, to have a meeting. If they're talking about advocates, what they mean, prison advocates? Because they have not spoke to groups. And they don't want us included in the legislative process and even revealing your training videos you use to teach your officers, reveal them to us so the community can weigh in what's effective or not. Because at the end of the day, we have a culture that lacks transparency. There's a reason why jails are built away from society. There's a reason why they're on Rikers Island. Supreme isolation, you could do what you want with a docile body. And I'm not going to play games with this. At the age of 17, I was one of those youths that happened to go to Rikers Island. And I'm gonna tell you, when you come to Rikers Island on a disciplinary bus, ask them about that training, that informal training. How do you deal with aggressive inmates? Do you have a conversation with them? No, in part my language is boot to ass. And that's a slogan amongst correctional officers. So when you say that you're representing advocates and you spoke with advocates, please be honest, because that was a lie under oath. Mm -hmm. They want to talk to us, they want to speak for us, but they don't want to speak with us. They, they're, they're clouded with these suggestions of security. Oh, they're not experts. Who's more qualified than a 17-year-old man, a kid, that spend 18 years in prison and have degrees in criminal justice. You want to hear my experience. You shouldn't run from it. When we talk about less is more and putting our lives on the line, I'm going to be totally honest. New York State has done a remarkable job ushering in us in a new historical platform for criminal justice. In order to fulfill that promise, we have to hold all accountable, and that includes DOC's employees. We can no longer hide behind security and fear of transparency. No, the thing you're hiding is that correctional officers are getting sick by working on Rikers Island. It's a documentary being prepared today. Former captains have cancer. 
from Rikers Island. So when we're talking about shutting it down, it is a justice imperative and a moral imperative. The need to pass less is more is because mass incarceration is continuing on technical violations. So we can't sit there and say we're a progressive state with draconian laws, antiquated behavior, real hostile. And all of Docs know we're coming to your community. We're going to live next door to you. We are experts. We hold degrees. If you want to have a conversation with intelligent people to come up with a resolution, stop hiding behind security. Because it's not party politics, it's not union politics, it's lives. They know what's going on in Rikers Island, and they talk about medical. Google it. I, the downside to New York State's incarceration and medical treatment. It'll pop up. I Googled it while I was sitting here. It's the worst. So when we're talking about what's going on, we really need transparency and we need to hold docs really accountable because what they said is we have a plan in development. We have a plan in development. Less is more is needed because what's going to happen is the efforts that Governor Cuomo, Mayor de Blasio, and Mark Jay used to reform this state, it is no legislation keeping mass incarceration from stopping because it was done, decarceration was done without legislation. We need this piece of legislation to hold all accountable. If we want to build a fair, just, and healthy society, let's start by passing this law and taking lives very seriously. Right. Yeah, I got a edge there. Thank you for that. Good morning. Thank you, Councilman uh, Peter, I mean Powers, sorry, for introducing Resolution 829. Yeah, you know, it's been <laughs> a long right. morning, all right? all right? We heard so much stuff. So um, I want to talk about less is more, even more strongly. I personally, uh, from my own experience and from the countless stories and, 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 and my relationships with formerly incarcerated people, know that Parole violations have become the new form of incarceration. And just as um, Mr. Shirali said, the numbers, right, the numbers that we know right now, 605, uh, they're increasing. I know some women personally who have been violated or threatened and awaiting adjudication, or whatever you may call it, right now for very simple, minor things that a normal, regular John and Jane Doe would not see as a problem. And right now we have approximately 35,000 people on parole in New York State, and that at any time that 35,000 could be sent back to prison, right? And so we're filling the beds again with, with bodies. And so we are concerned, strongly concerned. We've, we've been out there in the community. We've been speaking all over the state and having community members. You see here, heard our leaders just now speaking about less is more, that um, our certain communities within the city are targeted. There are certain people from, you know, let's say the Bronx, which is one of the highest rates, right? And it's, we call those million dollar blocks who are being reincarcerated um, for simplest things. And sadly, I hate to say this, but sometimes it's just walking while black. And so um, we have to really consider, you know, what we as a people, like you stated earlier, what we're going to do as a whole to really progressively make some changes within our system. And we need to pass less is more now. And I just have to say this because it has to do with um, solitary confinement and that as well. I spent two and a half years collectively in solitary confinement, six months of those on Rikers Island when I was a kid. And I want to tell you that first they called it uh, protective custody. And when they sent me to solitary confinement, which is called a Bing, it was the same thing. All I did was move across the hall. So when you hear the term protective custody, it is also solitary confinement because you have no interaction with anyone. And so you really need to understand these things. And we are the experts, and we can tell you what we have lived. Great, thank you. I want to thank all of you for your involvement in, in, in the effort to close Rikers Island. So. Thank you. May I just really? No, we're, you know, we got to go. We got it. We have, we have, we have three or four more panels. We got to keep going. Thanks. Thank you for your resolution, Council Member. Thank you. And hold them accountable about We're going to next up, we're going to have Cecilia Gentili, 
Jen Doman, Doman uh, Christina Herrera, Michael Verdal, Verdell, and Betsy Linzer. And I just, I just want to know, we have, we have four more panels of a lot, we have a lot of people testifying, so I'm going to cut you off in two minutes. It's, you have to obey, and it's, it's out of, it's not out of us, it's respect for the other people who are behind you who are looking to testify. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll start. Uh, over here on the right. Uh, um, good afternoon, um, Chair Powers and Council Members. And um, I'm just going to cut the whole um, thank you for doing this. Uh, and I'm going to go with my testimony. Um, my name is Cecilia Gentili. Uh, I am a transgender woman who was briefly detained in Rikers Island, where I was housed with male population. As a person with substance abuse issues at the time, I was dealing with a terrible addiction to heroin. Once sent to Rikers, I was not provided with any medication to help my situation. My stay in there was only terrible for the kind of harassment I experienced from the rest of the male identified individuals that I have to live with, but for the life-threatening withdrawal episode that lasted five days without any treatment. Needless to say, I was not provided with any mental health support to help me adapt to such a shocking reality. I believe making these changes in terms of treatment available for TGN CMB individuals, as well as revising the housing regulations and creating a task force to address policies related to treatment of transgender, gender nonconforming, and non-binary individuals in the Department of Corrections would make our stances in there more bearable and create an idea of recovery and mental health maintenance to keep after the release. After a short time in Rikers, I was handled, handled, handed to ICE, um, although they said that you know, uh, uh, Rikers would not you know, send ICE for you, they did. They picked me up, uh, who put me in deportation procedures. While waiting, I was put in isolation. I do know how hard it is to live in this situation, and I urge the New York State Legislature to pass the governor to sign the Humane Alternatives to Long-Term Solitary Confinement Act and condemn the Criminal Justice Committee and, 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 and applaud the Criminal Justice Committee for asking this measurement to be taken. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the testimony. We'll go next. Hello, my name is Jen Doman, and I am the supervisor for the Forensic Social Work Unit at New York County Defender Services. Thank you for listening to me today. In my six years there, as it relates to our transgender clients, I have noticed two outstanding issues. Don't know if I'll get to the second one. The first is the client's legal right to receive the necessary hormone therapy treatment that they need. The initial concern was whether or not they were receiving their hormones at all. It was a battle to make that happen for our clients. Six years later, DOC has made dramatic improvements in terms of getting clients their hormone treatment. The issue now is the timing of receiving the hormones. Imagine hating your body that you were born with, and then prior to incarceration, you were able to take agency over your own body by beginning the process of transitioning. You then become involved with the criminal justice system and it is a slow drip process waiting to resume your therapy modality. If a client is waiting at DOC for close to a month to receive their hormones, facial hair is returning, breast tissue is decreasing, psychological hell is happening. The client is already in hell by being incarcerated. We are simply asking that the hell not be compounded. Whether employees at DOC religiously or culturally agree with one's desire to transition from one sex to another is irrelevant. The speed with which incarcerated transgender people receive their hormone therapies is relevant and dramatically needs to improve. Thank you. Thank you, and I just want to know, we, we didn't have a chance to get into those, that issue as much as I'd, I'd like, but we have something that the council is 
concerned about in terms of the hormone therapy timing, dosage, and making sure that people are getting what they Thank you. Needed. Thanks, Thank Alana. You. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Powers and City Council members and staff of the Committee on Criminal Justice. My name is Cristina Herrera, and I am the CEO and founder of Trans Latinx Network. I'm here to talk about a series of introductions and resolutions around the treatment of transgender, gender nonconforming, and non-binary individuals in New York City jails. I want to take this opportunity to thank you all for your advocacy for the TGNC and B community around these very sensitive issues. As part of the Trans Equity Coalition and the Solutions Co Co Coalition, look to, um, we look to improve the lives of our New York City residents, especially the community um, that encounters the jail system. I want to speak about the experience of TGNC and B individuals at Trans Latinx Network and other community members significant work with these individuals and their experience going through that jail system and how important it is for these local pieces of legislature and resolution calling the New York State Legislature to pass and the government to sign the Humane Alternatives to Long-Term Solidarity Confinement Act is so important for the trans community. Our community needs mental health and substance abuse treatment in the jail system. As we have seen in, um, in research, our peers struggle with multiple health issues. As a transgender New Yorker and a community organizer who has been working with the TGNC and B community for the last 20 years, I have seen the many challenges that my community struggles with. One of the primary ones being mental health issues. There have been dozens of clients that I have worked with that have gone through the New York City jail system and have experienced being ignored when they ask for support around their mental health needs. In my work, I have observed members of the Trans Latinx network who have been sent to jails and have, ha have been housed with peers. Yeah, I need you, we need you to just sex. come to your final conclusion yeah. here. The last two lines. Sure. Good. Uh huh. Thank you. A house with their peers, um, their who are as, uh, as similar to be assigned a sex at birth instead of their gender identity, and sometimes being put in isolation confinement. This is dangerous, physically and mentally dangerous. Trans Latinx Network supports the legislature being introduced today. I thank you, um, Chair Powers, and the rest of the City Council. Um, uh, team and staff for your support in this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Go next. Thank you. Hello. This is on. Hello. Oh, sorry. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Betsy Lindor, and I am a member of Katal, and we are here for the Less Is More Bill. And this is my statement. Trust me, I'm not gonna go over two minutes. <laughs> It's very short. Um, basically, this is just my opinion, my my statement. Um, I feel like the Less Is More Bill is an excellent opportunity that the City Council, legislator, and the governor sh it should be passed. And the reason why the bill should be passed is for you know for people. Oh wait, actually, I'm so sorry. Is be able to have compassion for people who are making chance making changes in their lives for the better, and not have to deal with unnecessary technical violations going back and forth from Rikers and all of that stuff. So when it comes to Rikers as a whole, it does need to be closed because as we all know, it has a bad reputation. I'm not going into details as why, because at this point we all should know. And um, that's my statement. And I'm also going to be reading for Mr. Rabbi Michael, who is also part of Katal. And um, do you want to introduce yourself or no? Okay. Okay. Thank my you. Name, yes, my name is Michael Vidal, better known as Rabbi Michael. Um, I didn't bring my glasses, and that's why she's reading it yeah. off for me. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, do you want to borrow these? Yeah, well, do you, you want? Are you echoing her sentiment? Not a few. It's like. Uh, okay. Oh. Okay. 
Oh. All right. Hello again. <laughs> okay. This is his words. To whom we may concern, I am addressing this letter to you in regards to why I am as a person feel that Rikers Island should be closed down. Number one, Rikers Island is overcrowded. A lot of people that's in Rikers Island has mental problems. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> one form or another, maybe drugs or some form of drugs or alcohol or broken homes. Also, they do not have the proper counseling over there or mental health people over there to help them in their transition back out to the streets. Number two, there are lots of fights and things that go on there. A lot of people get hurt. They're just waiting to be transported back and forth to court. They have to get up at approximately four o'clock in the morning or maybe earlier just to get transported to court. If they do not get to court in time, the case is put off until another day. Also, fam also when families come over there to visit, it is very, very hard for a family member to be able to see their loved ones because they have to travel very, very far. If they, have, if they had a correctional facility or a jail in each borough, it would make it a little bit easier for them to get to court and have visits. And last but not least, there are four borough-based jails already existing in the boroughs that transport people back and forth to court. They can be expanded to include those on Rikers. Rikers is overcrowded. There are people waiting to go to court who cannot pay their bill because bail is too high. All right, thank you. We, we appreciate it. I want to know we've been joined by Councilman Rosenthal as well. I, I have to just jump to the hearing next door, so Councilman Rosenthal is going to chair for uh, the, the time, and this is our, our next great, time. Great, great. Thank Be you. right back. Thank you, Chair Powers, um, and thank you to this panel for your testimony. Oh, hi. It's really great. I'm, I, I have all your testimony, and I know the committee staff does, and everyone's reading everything very thoroughly. So thank you for that. I'm going to call up the next panel. Ahikia Dunstan. Oh, you did very well. Yeah. Alajo Rodriguez. Marcus Campbell. Marcel Sildor. Zachary Ketelson. And five, Manon Lamech. I think I did. Um, I'm also going to call up Andrea Bowen. Does, looks like not everyone is still here. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, if we could start with my left. So if you'd like to start, just introduce yourself and where you're from and, and speak to me from your heart. Okay, Better great. than testimony. <laughs> okay, great. Hi, I'm Ekithia Dunson. I'm here. I'm a Catal Center member. Uh, I would like to tell you that I thoroughly support the Less is More Community Supervision Revocation Reform Act. I'm a former New York City police officer and a formerly incarcerated woman. I just was paroled on July 5th of 2018. You know, it could be very stressful just having a te technical violation as a lingering thought, even though I have been successful while on parole. A technical violation is non-compliance with conditions of community supervision and includes not reporting to a parole officer missing curfew or testing positive for drugs. These are not crimes in of themselves. We can utilize our resources in a more efficient, effective, and comprehensive way that will empower and build successful communities. In addition to aiding the effort to shutter Rikers Island due to the significant amount of people that would be released from county and state jails and prisons if this legislation is not passed, if this legislation is passed, excuse me, the Less is More Community Supervision Revocation Act would shorten parole and probation terms overall, 
Studies show that the most reoffenses occur within the first year or two of supervision. Cap the amount of time people can spend in jail for technical violations before they must be released. Incentivize good behavior by allowing people to earn accelerated discharge such as mandating 30 days of probation or parole for every 30 days a person spends violation free in the community. Require a robust hearing with lawyers for the accused before a judicial officer before jailing someone accused of technical violations. Create a high legal threshold for jailing people on parole from minor offenses and ex expedite their hearings. Reallocate savings from these reforms to community programs that support reentry efforts for formerly incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. There should be no more delays in passing this bill, which will help with the closure of Rikers Island. Experiencing the unsavory conditions and inhumane treatment on Rikers Island will leave a bad taste in anyone's mouth. So today, I call on you, New York City Council, to pass this resolution. I call on legislature and the governor to pass the Less Is More Act, which would further decarcerate Rikers and jails and prisons across New York State and help people like myself to successfully reintegrate back into communities with their families. The city must take swift action to close Rikers because everyone deserves a quality of life, whether you're from Park Avenue or Park Bench. Thank you. Thank you for your eloquent testimony. <laughs> um, listen, I will say though, every single bit of testimony is already going to be in the record. And if you wanna just speak from your heart, and, and you know, within the time frame, we'll, we'll be able to hear that too, and that added piece will then be in the record. Good afternoon, my name is Zachary Katz Nelson. I'm the Policy Director at the Independent Commission on New York City Criminal Justice and Incarceration Reform, commonly known as the Lippman Commission. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and thank you for the introduction of the resolution in support of Less Is More. I want to focus on what the current parole population at Rikers, what it means for the closure of the jails there. Because uh, the numbers really speak volumes. Roughly 20% of the people who are incarcerated in the city jails right now are there because they have parole violations. Over 600 people for technical violations, but then over 500 people who are there for misdemeanors or low-level nonviolent felonies who would normally be free, but because pending trial, but because they have parole violations, they're automatically locked up. And so the city is spending actually upwards of half a billion dollars a year just focused on these folks, paying to incarcerate these people who under most circumstances would otherwise be free. And so this, and, and then the numbers alone, right? You have 1,100 people who are there, and if you took them out of the jail population, return them to the community where they're working hard, many of them, to try and succeed upon return from prison. It would dramatically change the population. It would dramatically change what the jails that the city is proposing right now to build, what those would look like as well. And so we really have this opportunity through Passage of Less is More to not just reform the, the parole system and its impact on the individuals and their communities, which is, which is critically needed, but also to really impact the city jails and speed up our opportunity to close Rikers as soon as possible. Thank you. Hi, thank you for having me, um, and thank you for the two people you spoke before me. Um, it's going to make my sharing a lot easier to provide, you know, to speak on. Um, my name is Alejo Rodriguez. I served 32 years in state custody in the Department of Corrections. Um, I also currently, though, I'm here today representing the Exodus Transitional Community. It's a reentry organization in East Harlem and to share some of our observations of some of the issues that many of our clients are faced with with dealing, having to deal with technical parole violations. And what we've learned and in the sense that we have gotten is that um, to violate individuals for minor violations, minor technical violations, no matter how minor, to punish them for these reasons and yet not reward for good behavior, for very significant good behavior, for individuals who are doing the right thing and helping to work with others, is an unjust system. It's very one-sided, and it actually perpetuates the resentment that individuals have 
towards law enforcement. It undermines really the relationship that we want to try to build with community members and having individuals return as productive citizens. The, the notion of, 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 of essentially having to walk on one tightrope after another is truly counterproductive. And it really undermines the work of a number of community-based organizations who is, whose missions are to provide the mentoring and provide the kind of resources needed to reinsure individual success. You know, when we talk about reentry and individuals on parole in this nature, the, the concept of reentry, one size does not fit all. A person's issues who've done three years in prison is a lot different than a person who's done 30 years in prison. And so we need to look at these things very, very closely. And this is why, as Exodus, we support the Less Is More bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. After hearing the three of you and looking at it very quickly, I'm going to talk to my legislative director about signing me on to the resolution as well. I appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal uh, and committee staff and Chair Powers. Um, uh, I'm Andrea Bowen. Um, I'm speaking as a consultant on behalf of the New York City Anti-Violence Project. I also coordinate the TGNCMB Solutions Coalition, which works to make sure city agencies are really doing their work with the community. I am also, AVP is also a member of the Trans Equity Coalition, which tries to get funding for TGNCMB-led and serving organizations. Um, so, uh, we support AVP, um, all of the intros and the resolutions within. Um, I want to make a couple of broad points um, around all this. First of all, um, AVP believes that the protections for TGC, TGNCMBI people within these intros um, are effectively already provided for within CCHR guidelines around um, gender, the gender identity and expression. So, we think it's already part of the law. That being said, um, statutes are always more important and powerful than agency guidance. Um, and so we're, we really support and applaud City Council for specifically naming TGNC MBI protections. Like that is a thing that is necessary in all areas of city life, especially DOC supports for substance abuse, mental health and housing. So um, my testimony has a lot of really technical um, recommendations, um, just like additions and subtractions to um, to the pieces of legislation. Um, I guess one other thing I wanted to note about the resos, um, uh, we hope that they could be amended just to mention that TGNC and BI people, especially TGNC and BI people of color, are at risk of state violence, including incarceration. Um, that isn't really noted in there. Um, AVP is a general position, and as my colleague Nala Toussaint from Callan Lord says, does not advocate or support the overall expansion of the jail and prison industry. Um, and that is pretty much my time. So uh, the rest of my testimony says a lot more. So thank you for your time. <laughs> no, Andrea, thank you. And um, you know, I'm noting on here, you were very specific in your written testimony, and that's incredibly helpful to the staff, to us. I'm reading through your comments on the bill that I'm proposing, and you're spot on right. And I like what you said, the importance of naming something is critical. And we're at a juncture where are we going to sweep things under the carpet or are we going to name them? Right. So I very much appreciate your comments. And um, you will absolutely see a different A version on my bill for sure. Yeah, thank you immensely. Yeah. And um, yeah, just, just to note, um, you know, there, there are a couple of notes that like we want to make sure that specifically local organizations that serve TG and CMBI people are included. We want to make Good. sure that folks that aren't just in trans housing um, are included. And so, um, and we also want um, one more, I guess, quick thing is making sure that like we get as much information on the granular level as possible. Um, and um, uh, Councilmember Moya's uh, intro, um, it talks about uh, providing aggregate information about trans housing. It, it occurs to me that if I were to do a FOIL request, um, I would probably get individual things just with indiv identifying information blacked out. Um, so I would like to see as granular as information as possible on the advocacy side, knowing what specific things people have faced will be really important. So that's just one other thing I wanted to get in. 
point, and there are always ways around it, you know, either by redacting or culling out the specific reasons without any identifying right. information I think whatsoever. But I agree with you, the devil's in the details. Yeah. So I really appreciate you. Thank you all for testifying Thank today. You. I'm gonna call up the next panel. Samuelin Cabasa, if I pronounce names wrong, my apologies in. You pronounce it right on Cabasa. Yeah? Yes. Jasmine Perez, Hannah Miller, Phil Miller, Scott Paltrowitz, and Dayan Tatro. And if I can just say for the record that on my bill in particular, which is intro 1535, I very much appreciate the testimony, um, yes, from the Anti-Violence Project, but also from um, the Legal Aid Society, the Bronx Defenders, and Brooklyn Defender Services, who have given us terrific specific suggestions to improve the bills, and we will be absolutely taking those suggestions into account. So I wanna thank you for that. All right, again, if we could start with you, just uh, your name, your organization, or if you're testifying on behalf of yourself, and from the heart, just a couple of minutes about why you're here, what, what powers you through today? Good afternoon and thank you for having me. My, my name is Daiwan Tetro. The views I express today are my own. However, I sit on the board at the Fortune Society and I am an alumnus of the Bard Prison Initiative. I had a prepared statement, but I'm also a debater, so I'm gonna ground my testimony today for you. And it's also very, very important. So I think I wanna take a moment to get away from the numbers and the facts and look at kind of the socio-psychological impact that parole has on people reintegrating back in society, right? This should be an arm of our government that is helping people effectively reintegrate themselves back into society, but how do you do that when you walk into a parole office every week and you are worried whether or not you're gonna go back to prison for one or another? I personally am currently on parole, and I go in there every week, and it feels like I'm walking back into prison. How do you make real life plans and life decisions when you don't know whether or not you're going to be free tomorrow for something as trivial as not coming home for curfew? Um, further, I often go to parole and sit there in excess of five hours every week to be heard for five minutes. That is in, an insane waste of time and productivity. Um, today, where I am in my life, parole is usually the only place I am confronted with criminal activity on a regular basis. You go on parole and you're solicited for drugs and every other things. It is a hotbed for that type of association. And I would also like to point out, especially in relation to the Less is More Act and the measures to strengthen kind of judicial process around people on parole, we need to be looking at the ways in which the parole is used to fuel mass incarceration. Specifically, there's a lot of people sitting on Rikers Island for um, technical violations, but some of them people are there on misdemeanors for new crimes. It's common practice for the court to ROR them people because they have a parole hold. Therefore, their time on Rikers is not counted towards their sentence, and we keep people in prison longer, right? And so there are all types of things like that around the judicial process that we also need to be looking at. Hello, um, thank you for having me uh, before you. I'm representing New York Cake um, on the Hall Solitary Act. Um, my name is Samuel Cabasa. I have a prepared statement to read. I tested it yesterday, it's gonna be under three minutes. Um, and uh, members of Cake uh, had other meetings to go to and I would ask your permission if after I read my testimony, I can read this one page on behalf of one of the members. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, my name is Samuel Cabasa, and I am testifying today as a member of the New York Cake Halt Solitary Campaign. Our campaign is a community of people who have survived solitary confinement, family members of people incarcerated, concerned community members, advocates, health and mental health professionals, 
and people in the human rights, health, faith, and social justice communities across New York State. I am testifying today to urge the City Council to adopt Resolution 143, which calls upon the New York State Legislature to pass and the Governor to sign the whole Solitary Confinement Act. Solitary confinement is torture. People in solitary in New York State are held up to 24 hours a day with no meaningful human contact or programming. I would know. I served 34 consecutive years in New York State prisons, spent eight years in 10 different solitary confinement units, 40 months in one stretch. I was alone in my cell for 23 hours per day, and for that last hour, I was held alone in, a, in different steel cages and or cinder block enclosures. Is that recreation? This practice has long been known to cause devastating harm, mentally, physically, and emotionally. Over 30% of suicides in New York prisons take place in solitary. A study in New York City jails found that people in solitary were seven times more likely to engage in acts of self-harm. Solitary also makes our prisons, jails, and communities less safe. Despite all this, thousands of our fellow New Yorkers are in solitary confinement each day across our state and tens of thousands each year. Black and Latino people are disproportionately subjected to this inhumane practice. People are held in solitary for months, years, and even decades. There are people in our state prisons who have been in solitary confinement for over 20 and 30 years. This is a horrific and unconscionable. Far too many minds and lives have been and continue to be destroyed. It has to stop. The whole Solitary Confinement Act would end the torture of solitary confinement and create more humane and effective alternatives. Specifically, HALT would end solitary beyond 15 days for all people in line with what is defined internationally as torture. Instead, HALT would create program-based alternatives proven to be more humane, effective, and safer. HALT would also restrict the criteria for what the conduct result in, uh, in solitary confinement or other separations, ban some groups from solitary entirely, and provide greater reporting and oversight. The New York State Assembly passed HALT last year, and now a majority of both senators and assembly members are official sponsors of the bill. The time for the state legislature and the governor to act is now. There must, they must enact HALT immediately. We therefore urge the City Council to adopt Resolution 143 and lend the voice of the City Council to say no to this torture. And if I, the letter from the prisoners, the one letter? Okay, thank you. Hello, um, I'm Jasmine Perez. I'm a social worker. I'm from Destination Tomorrow. Um, I, as a social worker, I work with LGBTQ youth of all ages, and also as an out trans woman, I have heard personal accounts of people within the um, criminal justice system. Um, in, uh, before I go into the prepared statement, um, I do uh, want to, I have a concern with the trainings that the officers are getting it, at Rikers. Um, <laughs> Uh, the concern that I have around it is because I always come back to this as a social worker when it comes to trainings that I'm creating around tolerance and acceptance because I feel that we can sit in a training all day long. We can learn about LG this, BTQ that, but I don't know if it's really sinking in into people, which is what I'm getting at in terms of it barely being tolerated. So in, you know, in their personal accounts, I have heard a lot of my trans clients be constantly misgendered and with them not being using with them not using the correct uh, gender pronouns so as, you know as a social worker you know I've heard a lot of misuse within the solitary confinement because they did not know where to house them and as a being that they uh, I'm sorry I'm sorry it was I, just so distracting to me <laughs> oh I appreciate you we were just you're you're a very powerful person and oh. we were just talking about that Oh, okay. Uh, so sorry to be talking <laughs> off mic about you, but that's what we were talking about. Um, we got you. Keep. Uh, oh, sorry, that's so okay. So do you want to just submit your testimony? Well, my testimony's there. Um, but I'll tell you, I just heard you. 
okay. very loud and clear. Well, in terms of, I'm trying, just going back to what you were talking about before and just speaking from your heart rather than speaking from the prepared statement, um, what's coming from my heart is that of getting over, uh, the tolerance and acceptance, what I was just saying before, and also in regards to hormonal regimens. I find that with the accounts that I've heard from trans inmates, that when they're being put in solitary confinement, that they're all of a sudden being forgotten about. And when they're forgotten about, it's like they're, they're, they're not, their mental health is not being addressed and their hormonal uh, regimen is not being addressed as well. And so those are the two main things that I'd like to come from from my heart, and the rest is within my prepared statement. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. So my name is Phil Miller. I represent the Correctional Association of New York. Um, we're an independent nonprofit organization that was established in 1844, and we monitor all of New York State's prisons. Um, so you already have my testimony, my formal testimony. So I'm just going to speak a little, a little differently and summarily. Um, I'll say, as an organization, we support um, both the Halt and the Lessers More Acts. Um, specifically for Halt, we support it because it puts some serious limits on the inhumane practice of isolated confinement. Um, and it's long overdue for something like this to happen. And uh, from a personal perspective, I'll say that I spent some years in solitary confinement. So I can tell you that just sitting in a cell locked away, the days of the week merge together. You lose a sense of time. It's easy to stop talking to people. And by the time you actually leave that place after many years, your muscles have atrophied so much, it's difficult to even walk down a hallway. Um, so the whole build is, uh, is a really good step in the right direction. Um, in terms of Resolution 829, which concerns the Less is More Act, we support this because it really puts some serious limitations on technical parole violations and also reforms um, how much time parole violations uh, can lead to in terms of reincarceration. Um, technical parole violations, they're really minor things, but they completely disrupt uh, rehabilitation, reintegration, they disrupt family relations. Any progress someone has made can totally be destroyed in, in a second because of it. Um, any um, housing opportunities someone has disappear immediately. And so from an organizational perspective, we support the Less is More Act because any law that can help more people remain free to establish connections with their families and move forward with their lives is something that I think we should also support. Um, and then from a personal perspective, I'll say that sitting in a parole office um, with other people who are waiting to see the parole officers, you can feel the fear in that room because so many people are there happy. They just got a new job. They might have just had a new child, and they really don't know if they're going to be violated or not because two days ago, they didn't answer a phone call on time from their parole officer. And so it's, it's a constant state of anxiety where people are trying to move forward, but these little rules je can jeopardize everything and really keep people trapped in a cycle that they can't escape from. And so these laws need to be passed. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for your powerful testimony today. Really appreciate you. I'm going to turn it back to the chair, Councilmember Power. Thanks for that. And I know you're on a list somewhere uh, yeah, to go I ask know. questions, <laughs> too. So thank you for that. Um, OK. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. I'm going to call up the next panel. We have uh, Charlie Solidum from the LGBT Network. Uh, uh, Pace, someone from Pace Law School, Michael, I can't read your last name, I'm, I apologize for that. Uh, Juan, Juana Peralta from the Center, Nala Tassan from the Callan Lord Community Center, and Juana Peralta from the LGBT Center. I think we're waiting for one or two more. But before I start, I want to just say thank you for waiting and being patient with us. I know it's, it's hard to sit through all this and knowing many of the work that your organizations are doing, we're, we're very happy that you were able to join us today. And we've also been joined by uh, Councilman Rolander, I think, br for br briefly, but come in. Uh, well, why don't we get started? You want to start on the, on the left. And again, same thing, if you can just state your name and your organization before you start, that'd be great. Thanks. Uh, sure. Hi. Um, thank you, Chairman Powers. I'm, um, uh, my name is Charlie Solidum. I'm the program manager of HIV STI services at the LGBT Network, uh, Queens LGBT Center. Um, I'm going to diverge from my written testimony because you guys have that, um, and it does cover a lot of what we have already discussed today, um, but I just wanted to add the additional commentary 
um, that we've heard a good amount of testimony today about how transgender inmates um, are routinely denied access to crucial services. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a specific case of one client I have encountered um, who actually did end up accessing healthcare at Rikers. Um, but the unfortunate thing is that even though in that outlier of a case she was able to access healthcare, um, that pro provider was not at all prepared to provide medically sound information to this woman. Um, she had been on street hormones on the outside, um, but upon bringing up hormones to her provider at Rikers in order to receive those hormones under the supervision of a doctor for the first time, um, that provider actively dissuaded her from pursuing hormones while in jail um, because he told her his reasoning was that um, providing her hormones would cause her to have a stroke. Um, now I want to be clear that there is no peer-reviewed available data for this claim. Um, I've been working in transgender health for over a decade and I've seen this sort of tactic before. Um, it is absolutely a scare tactic that is uh, utilized in order to, uh, for that provider to avoid doing their job of being able to provide care to this patient. Um, it's clear that um, in this circumstance, um, in this exceptional circumstance, that even though um, this trans woman was able to access medical services, these services were woefully inaccurate, providing um, inaccurate information and uh, inadequate care for this person. So I just wanted to highlight that, and I will yield the rest of my time. Great, Dick, and I know that's something we really care about, and I think it's going to be part of our follow-up conversation. Thank you for that. Thank you. Are we yeah, yeah. Uh, back to the left? And then. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Hello, my name is Juana Peralta and I'm the Director of Economic Justice Initiatives at the LGBT Center in the West Village. Um, I'm also gonna reiterate some of the points that other advocates have made and we've submitted our written statement. I'm gonna diverge from it a bit. Um, transgender and gender nonconforming community members face challenges concerning healthcare access and safety within the criminal justice system at large. These problems are only magnified in jails where corrections officials argue that the temporary nature of the system provides an excuse to overlook severe, harmful, and dehumanizing practices. Gender transition-related he health care, like Charlie mentioned, including access to hormones and tgnc competent mental health care providers within city jails is inconsistent and difficult to access. Oftentimes, individuals are unable to continue existing treatments or unable to receive the health care that they need. This is further compounded given the disproportionately high rates of incarceration of TGNC individuals. The continuous and tremendous stress around barriers, lack of clarity of the process, amount of time spent around self-advocacy required to access anything often dissuades individuals from requesting and accessing any of the health care they desperately need. There's consistent and intentional misgendering, increasingly harming community members that are already vulnerable in this space. Many incarcerated individuals face humiliation and degradation from both correction staff and other prisoners. Inconsistent policies like folks have shared and practices around staff members about how to interact with TGNC identified individuals, sometimes within a single facility, lead to unnecessary fear, fear and emotional trauma of incarcerated individuals. I wanna share some personal experience. I was a former staff member of the Sylvia Rivera Law Project um, and I heard consistently from, TH, um, from community members that were in the THU during my visits when it was housed at the Manhattan Detention Complex, that folks were routinely misgendered, that there was a lack of clarity of any grievance process, that there was overall confusion um, about the lack of clarity. Can I just share one more point? There was a group of advocates that was routinely meeting with DOC staff, and when the MOSS group joined, the meetings stopped after two meetings, after people were told that TGNC people were new to DOCS, and they refused to be transparent about any of the housing directives reflected. Um, and they also just had an internal bias around TGNC people that was apparent and they refused to address it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us, thanks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael Mushlin. I wanna thank you for holding this, this hearing and giving us the opportunity to testify. I'm a law professor at Pace University and I have been involved for over 40 years in the effort uh, to reform solitary confinement. So I'm, I'm happy to be here in support of the resolution 143, which I think is a very important uh, document. There are five reasons that I'd like to, to offer for why the city council will do a very important thing if it adopts this resolution. One is the solid, as you've heard, 
Uh, so, and as you know, solitary confinement is torture. Uh, it's burying people alive. It, 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 it causes suicide, it causes self-mutilation, it, ment it exacerbates mental illness, it causes mental illness. The people that survive solitary confinement, and you've heard from some of them today, have enormous courage. It's a, it's a pain that should not be inflicted on people. And we've known this. The second reason is it violates fundamental human rights. And we've known this for over 170 years. J Charles Dickens said it best when he came to America and he saw solitary confinement being used in Philadelphia. He said it's a dreadful punishment that inflicts an immense amount of torture and agony, which no man has a right to inflict upon his fellow creatures. Ten years ago, Atal Gawande in The New Yorker wrote that when we look back on this period, we'll, we'll look back at a time when we condone legalized segregation and we'll look back at a time when we condone legalized torture. Solitary confinement violates fundamental human rights. It violates the UN standards on the treatment of prisoners. I was privileged to be on the ABA task force on the legal status of prisoners that led to the adoption of standards for the treatment of prisoners by the legal profession uh, and that it condemns solitary confinement and says that's a violation of the standards of the profession. Solitary confinement is unnecessary. We now know it's not needed. The profession has come to a consensus that it can be done, uh, that we can t take care of everyone without solitary confinement. It's inflicted on tens of thousands of New York citizens today. So the city council, we're at a historic moment, and I'm just so happy that the city council has this resolution, and I urge you to pass it. I hope it'll be passed unanimously by the city council. Me too. Hello, my name is Nala Simone Toussaint. I speak as a woman of trans experience in my role as a transgender health uh, advocacy coordinator at Colin Lord, as well as a part of the Trans Equity Coalition and the Solution Coalition. So my statements will focus on our support on intro 1513, a bill requiring all department facilities housing transgender, gender nonconforming, non-binary, and intersex individuals to have access to comprehensive mental health treatment. So Colin Lord is a community health center that provides integrated primary and behavioral health care. We estimate more than 20% of our behavioral health patients have history with the criminal justice system. We can attest firsthand to the need for behavioral health and mental health service for TGMB individuals in New York City's jail. And so if you see on uh, one of the testimony, there are about uh, five asks that we have received from our response and communication to uh, TGMB folks who are incarcerated. So we get over uh, 20 a year. And so I want to highlight the, the fifth overarching act, which is about um, receiving legal support around discrimination in the prison system, and including information regarding what their rights are as a transgender and gender non-binary inmate. So there's a lack of information. Um, so the lack of information is is a recurring theme in the letters that we receive. Um, and which, what it does create is a lack of, it creates a lack of hope, and it creates isolation. I, I want to highlight uh, uh, two, about two stories. Um, one of our, our former patient named Brittany was formerly incarcerated and shared with our mental health provider that she was placed in solitary confinement while she served five years. She told the provider that this was the only option given and explained that it was meant to save her life from the inmates, but she ended up being ripped to pieces by the guards. She explained that she was able to deal with it most days because she was drugged by such, by, with the psychiatric uh, medication. The, can I just say one more point, please? Um, when our youth, a transgender female, shared with me that uh, when she was sent to New York City jail, she, w had never, she had never had sexual activity before. So imagine an adolescence, your niece, your nephew, who had never shared a romantic kiss or had sexual encounter with anybody. Housed in a male's jail, her sexual debut was being raped multiple times per week in order to survive. In order to have the costly protection by one co-dwelling inmate from other inmates. So there, there are some other uh, stories that I included in both of the testimonies. Uh, thank you so much again for uh, supporting these bills. 
Thank you. Thank you for everybody for your patience and your advocacy here as well. Um, and I want to thank all the groups who came before us and testified today. As 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 always uh, on the legislation before us, it's uh, very extremely helpful to hear the comments and uh, and positions of the groups that are and and agencies that are working in this area. And we, uh, you know, after all these hearings, always fine. We have much more work to do in areas where we uh, didn't get enough time to focus on uh, at this committee hearing as well. So we look forward to our continued work all together. I want to thank again my staff for helping to put this together, and uh, and thanks everybody for for being here today. Thanks.